my plan for today is to move into the other territory, which is feedback, and to just talk about the basics of feedback, starting with starting with uh, linear feedback that has delay in it. So the feedback, what's the right word? The, the things about feedback is, is there delay or not, and is it linear or not? Um, the simplest feedback systems are feedback systems that have no delay and are linear, and you can't make those with a computer for reasons that I'll get into in gory detail later. Oh, I'm going to do another thing, which is I'm going to see if anyone's waiting outside the door. Yeah, the building is locked for some good reason today. I think it's just an extra layer of security that will keep us all safe. Um, okay, so the, uh, oh, and I have notes, so that would be a good thing to get out so I can make it. Okay, so here is the, here is the, the thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little test sound and then start feeding it into delay networks with, uh, with some purpose or other that we'll get to later. Uh, so the test sound is going to be new. Uh, I'm going to make a line tilde. Actually, I'm going to make a V line tilde. Oh, uh, Should I tell you this? Maybe I'll tell you this, maybe not. Uh, let's see. Uh, cancel. Make an object. Make it be output. Here's a thing about uh, making envelope generators for making sound. Um, you can do this if you want. Let's see. Let's have a nice metronome. And we'll run it, uh, I don't know, every once in a while. And then I'm going to make a line. And I'm just going to make the line have a rise and a decay shape controlled by the metronome. So the way to do that is going to be right when the metronome goes off, I'm going to send the thing a message to go to 1 and do it in 5 milliseconds, say. And then after a delay of 5 milliseconds, does that work? then I'm going to tell it to go back down to 0 in 5 milliseconds. And you would think that this would make a nice, clean, cool impulse. Not impulse, but bump anyway. And the observation is going to be that it doesn't do anything. Hmm? There's, it's just the sound source. I'm just being a sound source. But the problem that I'm having is probably that, that maybe that this channel isn't hooked up, or maybe that I'm going to the wrong speaker. Oh, that's it. I'm going to the wrong speaker. Yeah, I'm, going, I'm, I'm playing through my PC speaker, so I'm going to fix that. Oh. Connect audio. Yeah, physically to equipment. Of the ten things I have to do to get started, there are ten factorial orders that I could try to do them in, and there are not enough classes to go through them all. Now, did that fix anything? Hey, yeah. All right, this is all right. This is not art. This is just me making little envelope generator things. Um, the the thing I want you to know about this is that if you um, if you repeat this, okay, with the settings that they are that that are in place right now, you can't actually hear that those pulses are all. Well, they come in three flavors, that are different sounding. Which you might have wanted, and which you might not. Uh, to make it uh, all too clear, let's make the rise and decay shape be very quick. There you go. What is happening now is, a th is, an, is one aspect of something that I have to tell you about for other reasons later on in the day, which is the block size thing about PD. L um, let's turn this off. All right. Um, the, all right, so what I made was a nice audio signal that theoretically goes from 0 to 1, and then, one, and then 5 milliseconds later uh, ramps from 1 down to 0. What actually happens is um, the metronome... Let's see. What's, what's happening is that the audio computation in pure data and the message passing in pure data, the control computations, are happening round robin. So it does one block's worth of audio and then one block's worth of message and, and so on. And so the, uh, the number of samples that come out of the line tilde between hits of this metronome or between um, uh, segments of this line are multiples of 64. Um, this is the easy way to do stuff. And um, it's not actually inherently 
a limitation of, of blocking the audio that, the, uh, that, that this is happening, that there are multiples of 64 samples between the breakpoints. But 64 samples is 1.45 milliseconds at our sample rate, and that's not a multiple of one, so, or not, it doesn't divide into one. So in fact, what happens is, rather than 1.45 milliseconds all the time, 45% of the time it's one millisecond, and 55% of the time it's two milliseconds. This is just fine if you're using line tilde in a rational, ordinary way as an envelope generator, you know, to just turn a thing on and off, because typically rises and decays last 10 or 20 milliseconds. Because if you're doing it faster than that, you're, you're getting, going kind of fast. And even if I make it very fast, like five milliseconds, it's still not to the point that you are likely to hear the difference. Now that I've sensitized you to it, you can, yeah? <laughs> okay. And you will hear this difference even if you decide to envelope an isinusoid with this. Um, there, you know, the sinusoid will have a s steeper or less steep slope, and that will be a subtly different sound. Um, okay, so the reason that I'm telling you that is because you can do this if you want. You can ask for the more expensive line tilde. Well, that's interesting. Not zero, please. How about one? The more, ex the more expensive one is called V-line. And V-line's definition is to... Now someone's trying to get it. Right. V-line's definition is not is to uh, start the segment off at the exact logical time that the message arrived. And now there's this... Now there's a... Let's see. Now there's a time zone problem, because uh, which? What do you mean by that logical time? The the the, the line the V line tilde got a message at some point before a block of computation was happening, but in fact the logical time of the message passing is being allowed to get up to one block ahead of the signal computation, which then does this does the computations that correspond to all of the control messages that got pulled in, and smart objects like V line tilde can actually look at the exact time at which it received the message, or the time that it was when the message was created, which is just a number. And then it will actually arrange for the ramp to start at the corresponding sample and not right, right immediately when its next block of computation starts. So, uh, so V-line tilde is not just sample accurate, but subsample accurate. It will actually put the corner between two samples and figure out what, you know, what to give the segments by way of values to have the breakpoint be exactly at the point in time that you asked it for. And you can even take that to the point of making a nice oscillator out of it. So I can say now, let's, um, let's, go, let's go at 100 hertz. And to do that, I'll just say, let's have 10 milliseconds here. That's, yeah, I think so. Well, V-line, because it does that, there's a complication, which is what if you asked it for three or four segments to fall within a single block? actually remembers all of the segments that you ask it so that it can schedule multiple segments within a block, which line tilde does not do. So here is a 100 hertz uh, trapezoidal wave. Um, and if you did that without the V, get away V, you hear the, <laughs> that's clock jitter. This is why your converters should not have clock jitter. And, okay, so anyway, that was all just so that I could tell you why I was using the V-line object. Um, and now what I'm going to do is take this sound here and alias it somehow or other. What's a good way? Well, we'll worry about that later. Oh, right. I guess I'll worry about it now. How about, uh, how about I make little sinusoidal chirps and make them all exactly the same? Now, of course, you might not want it all exactly the same, but you at least ought to be able to make it all the way to s exactly the same if you do want it to. So now I'm going to make my second mistake, which is I'm going to multiply the thing by a nice oscillator, and I'm going to ask for the oscillator to be going at, I don't know, 500 hertz. Oh, even, I'll even, no, I won't make it A, because A is so close to a submultiple of the sample rate that I might get special stuff happening, I'm not sure. Uh, okay, so now we're just going to take that V-line and multiply it by an oscillator. It's not, oh, 500 was too special a number. <laughs> All right, my my diff
demo is failing. You're not hearing that these are all different from each other again. Let's, uh, let's exaggerate the effect. What is wrong? Oh, there's a problem. <laughs> Well, now this is extreme. What I did was I made the wavelength of the oscillator much longer than the envelope, so sometimes the envelope kicks when the oscillator is going through zero, so you don't get anything. <laughs> so this is a little stupid. Uh, but in fact, even if I gave that thing a, um, a real frequency, you should hear different sounds depending on what phase the oscillator happens to be at. I don't hear it. OK, so maybe I don't, maybe I don't have to care about this. If, if I were to care about this, what I would do is I would now make a message to tell the oscillator to rephase itself to zero every time the metronome goes off. And now, I believe it's the case that every single one of these, whatever you call them, ticks, is going to sound exactly alike. All right. My purpose in doing all this is to have something to drive my my delay networks with, and I'm just trying to explain what I'm doing in order to be complete about what's going on. Um, and anyway, it doesn't hurt anyone to know good patching technique. All right. Now maybe I'll keep this around just in case we want it. And now I'm going to start to bore you terribly with the stuff that you all know about recirculating delay lines, except that after a while I guess it will get interesting again. So the way to bore you is this. Um, let's, um, let's start, let's do carpless strong synthesis. Purpless strong synthesis is what hap is a thing where you say, well, oh, all right, that was a nice waveform that I just made. It uh, lasts two milliseconds, all told. What would happen if I now took that thing and repeated it 100 times a second? Well, OK, well, we already know, because it should sound like this. Oh, wait. Oh, my god. <laughs> yes. This oscillator's phase is not getting set at the same time as this B line is starting because it's off by up to a millisecond because that is not block corrected. So really the correct thing to do is drive this with a V line and now it's going to get tricky because the V line then has to uh, the V line now has to drive a waveform like this. Hey, no, go away. So I'm going to tell the V-line to go to zero in no time at all, and then go up to 100 in 100 milliseconds. That's, uh, that's one kilohertz. That's uh, 1,000 units per second, because I'm asking it to ramp up to 100 in one-tenth 100 one of a second. And then I can just say, cool, all I'd have to do is take the cosine of that. Oh, wait, V-line it. You can actually use it for V-line. And then I'll take the cosine of that. Now it's going to work. Yeah. Except now you don't have to believe me that this is really oscillating <laughs> until I slow it back down. So now if I do this and make this longer, then you should hear nice oscillations. Yeah. All right, so now I've actually made little beeps, but I've made little beeps that are always exactly identical to each other. And that was a lot of work, and I'm sorry. There, there are no easy ways to get exact results in real-time systems. It's possible, but you have to think about all these cruddy little details. All right. So now, uh, let's make this go a lot slower. Let's see if it's still doing something useful. All right. Now what I'm going to do is say, that's a nice waveform, as we established. We just made a nice buzzing sound out of it. Uh, let's see if we can make that buzzing sound using a recirculating delay network. So got this little thing, and all I have to do is now repeat it every hundredth of a second, say, and then I'll have a nice tone. So to do that, let's turn off the metronome. Now I'm going to say del write, uh, or used Fred, Sue, and then and we'll make a, a second's worth. All right, so this is... This is PD's delay package. There's a delay write and then two versions of delay readers that I'll get to in a second. Well, actually, the first one happens right away. The 
because it's just going to be del read. And I'll ask it for the same delay line. So that, so that name is there so that if you have more than one of them, you can give them different names and they know, will know which is which, but the reads know which write they correspond to. And the rule here is that the delay write is the thing which puts the stuff in the delay line and allocates the memory for it. So you should have one of those for each given name, and then you can have as many reading objects as you would like. Okay, and I'm going to say, uh, well, to start with, let's, let's uh, just read it after a second has passed. And now I'm going to make a feedback loop, because that's what the course is about, after all. And now we're going to do this, and then we're going to listen to the result. Like this. I should make myself one of these. It's just mono. <laughs> Oops. Oh, save. Yes, indeed. Let's save this. Uh, I've forgotten what the naming scheme was. Oh, just numbers. 3A. Uh, 1 dot. Um, what's this? <laughs> Feedback. Delay. All right. And now I'm going to give it one pulse. Now we have a nice oscillator. <laughs> All right. uh, this is exactly how oscillators work in, in computer music. You do something and then you feed it back and the something about the feedback makes the thing do repetitive behavior. Although I'm oversimplifying, it doesn't always work exactly this way. Um, and if I want this to be an audible frequency, oh, first off, how do I turn it off? Right now the only way I have to do that is to disconnect it. <laughs> But in fact, what I should consider doing, let's see, I'm going to take the read and I'm going to add it explicitly to what goes in here. So there's going to be a plus tilde. And I'm going to put in whatever I put in like that. But then uh, the recirculating delay, I'm going to make controllable in amplitude, or in gain, I should say. So I do that by making multiplier and multiplying it by anything that I want. So to start with, I'll just do 0 and 1, I guess. All right, and now we have this. So wait, let's listen to it. Oops, sorry. Turn on the feedback. And now, of course, do all this kind of stuff. Right? And then I can clean it up by turning the feedback off and waiting a second. All right? Carp was strong idea. Oh, this is an oscillator. Let's do this at audible frequencies. So now let's say 10 milliseconds, please. And now I'll turn this on. And turn this down and make just one click. And now I've got my nice sound that I... It's the same sound as I made earlier, except now I'm making it using feedback network. And now if you really want to have it sound like car plus strong, you do this. You multiply it by something slightly less than one. Is it a good idea? Yeah, I'm just going to make this numerical. Okay, so let's get rid of this. Let's give ourselves a number box. Hey. Huh? Oh. And I'm going to control it in hundredths. I don't know why. That's probably a good choice. So I'm going to divide by 100. And I'm going to give this thing the typical MIDI range of 0 to 128. And uh, I'm going to turn this down. <laughs> this is a class on feedback, after all. Um, OK, so now I think, oh, yeah, let's, uh, this metronome is cool, but what if I just wanted one, of, one bang? I really would like to have a nice bang here. Oh, no, not that kind of bang. So now I have a weight of just triggering the thing once. All right, and now I turn this thing up to 99. Eh, good enough, and then it says, yeah, right. Now I can turn this up, but I've got the mixer gain down. All right, and this is, all right. Uh, this sounds cool for uh, until it stops sounding cool, and the thing that makes it stop sounding cool is the fact that everything sounds pretty much like a decaying sound like that. Uh, 
This was proposed as a, as a way of synthesizing string sounds and plucked string sounds, I should say. And in fact, the original Karp plus Strong notion was instead of using, um, using an impulse like this, use a burst of noise like this maybe. Let's make it 10 milliseconds long. And let's multiply this thing not by this cosine, but just by noise. Not nose. Okay, I've got a U in there now. Come on. All right, I got it. Nope, wrong. <laughs> by the way, don't do this. That m adds these two and then multiplies it by zero. Not what you want. Okay, and now what have we got? Uh, let's see, 99, got that up, and now I trigger it. Ta da. All right, someone heard that at Stanford University about 20 years ago and thought it was so good that they ran out and patented it and everything else. And then, of course, then the next time they tri triggered the thing, there it was again, and then people forgot it. Uh, actually, what people, what people do is they put a nice low-pass filter on, like this, maybe. I'm just guessing. And then you get this wonderful effect. That's the actual sound that they got that they thought was so cool. It actually sort of goes doing, so, but then it goes doing every single time. And, so, and there's a piece that you can listen to. I don't know if I should name the piece. There's a piece that get, does Carpless Strong that everyone's heard that uh, goes on for a little bit too long. And then everyone has heard enough Carpless Strong for their entire lifetime, and so the synthesis technique is now washed out. Right. Okay. Um, what happens when, oh, first off, what happens when you give this thing a negative feedback? You get this. <laughs> that, uh, that's a strange sound which most people only get when they do this to a long pipe. Um, it, uh, at this, at this um, fundamental pitch, you don't ascribe a, frequent, or a, a pitch to this so readily. But in fact, it is a nice sound that has only odd harmonics. And... Um, and instead of having a period of 10 milliseconds, it has a period of 20 milliseconds. So it's a 50 hertz tone with odd harmonics. And that's the odd harmonic flavor of Carpal is Strong. And now, since I don't own these speakers, I can show you what happens when you push it. It does that. <laughs> and furthermore, <laughs> I'm just turning it every though. Just turning it off. It'll do this until, at some point, it will exceed the floating point capacity of PD, or of, of ANSI floating point. In fact, let's just look at it now. See how many decibels we're getting out. 400 decibels. Um, let's see, every 10 de oh, and now it's infinity. <laughs> OK, it's too big. Um, yeah, what does it sound like, by the way? Just about the same. All right. Okay. Let's um. Uh, let's see. First off, now that we've got infinity coming out of here, how do we? Oh yeah, this is a thing that you all should know about. Uh, infinity is bad if you get it in if you get it in recirculating networks because one plus infinity is still infinity, and it might even be the case that zero times infinity is infinity. I'm not sure. Let's turn the feedback off. Oh, it recovered. Okay, that's good. Oh, it's NAND that it's, it's NAND that you really don't want to hit. So, when, which is what you get when you take the square root of a negative number or something like that. And then when you get NANDs circulating in a feedback path, then you can never get rid of them because zero times NAND is NAND. It's, it's like what happens when you add brown paint to your red paint. It turns brown, and then you can add as much red as you want. It's still going to be brown, or salt to your coffee, or whatever metaphor you want. Right. Um, for that reason. Uh, Actually, for that reason, delay write uh, actually looks at the values that you write into it, and if you feed it a nan, it will just write zero <laughs> as a way of attempting to prevent you from doing that. But there are still ways that you can sneak nans into feedback loops that I have not figured out how to prevent yet because I don't know what they are. So people are always getting nans in their patches, and then they're complaining because, you know, you, uh, you this output thing, of course, goes into... A digital to analog converter. Now suppose any, suppose you have some 
Hey, why did this close? Oh, I've lost my mouse again. Oh, gosh, I hate this. Why does this happen? Oh, maybe I've got... Um, yep. Wow. Okay, did I get it back? No, it is now clicking madly. Wow. Well, that's what I thought it was last time, but that's actually... I think, oh, you know what? I think this is my pad because my pad's light is blinking. So let's, oh, maybe I just saved myself. <laughs> All right, let's see. No, oh, and the thing's still blinking. All right, uh, unplug pad. The pad does not turn off when you unplug it. Maybe I do that. All right, the pad is off. Okay, I think that was I think that was the pad fighting me something. Hope so anyway. All right, so um, yeah, na nans. Um, if you add nan to zero, you get nan. If you multiply nan by zero, you get nan. If you have a patch with ninety nine windows, all of them creating signals, ninety eight of which are making beautiful music, and the ninety ninth of which is making nan, the result that gets sent out to the DAC is nan, <laughs> which sounds like nothing. So nan is not your friend. And I wish there were a way to prevent it ever from happening, but I've never been able to find it. All right. Okay, so how do you prevent things from blowing up in, in feedback networks? Well, the thing that, well, there are two possibilities. One is you could design your feedback network so that it's impossible to make it blow up. And the other thing that you could do is you could always put a clipping object in there so that, um, so that it can't blow up. And that is, in fact, what I typically do. Whenever I'm doing something that I don't feel absolutely certain about, I put a clip in there in order to make it not get past some reasonable value. And a reasonable value could be a, a nice, ridiculously high one. Like, suppose I'm, uh, suppose I'm doing the... Now I've got the second problem, which is I can't get in and out of edit mode. Oh, I can't click. Oh, man. Oh, it's because I've got the open... Oh, oh, that's what that's what causes the clicking to fail. Nope. Clicking is working and clicking is not working. Okay, so do I restart PD or does something else have to happen? Save. Oh, the key accelerator for save is dead. All right, so this now is this now is the thing that I have discovered, which is. Oh, oh, that was my whole problem, probably. Yep, everything's happy now. <laughs> all right, are we able to do stuff? Yes, okay. Um, all right, so I was probably saying something useful there, but I love Oh, right, so we're going to put a clip tilde in the middle of the feedback path. Um, all right, so let's do it. Let's, let's say... And, you know, this isn't so important just yet, but it'll get important later on. So here I'm just going to say clip tilde minus one, one. Um, I'm going to be brutal about it this time, although really what I probably should do is go get a nice um, uh, cubic clipping function. But I forgot to make a copy of my... I, I worked it all out and, and, and made one, and now I've forgotten where I put it. So I'm going to have to figure out the cubic clipping function again and then put it in later. Um, it's actually worth knowing about, so if you care, I'll, I'll leave the calculations up on the board or something. Okay, so, so oh, in fact, oh, I'm, I'm contradicting myself. Really, clip between minus 10 and 10 because um, you don't want it to clip when you're using it normally. And using it normally is probably having the output gain being somewhere on the order of 1, but maybe you know a tenth or, or something like that. So if you want this thing not to clip, even if, you, um, even if you divide it by 10 in order to listen to it, make the thing only clip when the thing gets outrageously loud, like plus 20, you know, uh, you know, 20 dB too loud, which is a multiple of 10 in amplitude. Right. And then we have this. Let's see. Let's, let's, give us, let's do the responsible thing. Oops, not, that's the wrong. 99. Uh, I think everything's good. Oh, right, I think I've turned the output off. Ooh, that didn't sound good. Oh, that's the mixer, though, I think. 
There it is. And now I can do the thing that I wanted to do the whole time, which was this. Yeah. And now I have a wonderful... Shut this up. And, and now, of course, the next thing you should be doing is changing the delay time. And then you can do this. Oh, that was bad. I sent it to zero. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Forget that. Clean it out. <laughs> Try again. Um, what I just did was I made it have DC in the in the delay line. Oh, no. oh yes. It's... Okay, and it's getting louder and louder, right? But now I've also got... Synthesizer. Okay, something probably will go bad later on, but I'll just let it uh, go bad when it does. Um, there's a limit to how high you can take this. Actually, there are two things that could be irritating about this or, or limiting about this. One is that um, one is that delay read that. The length of the delay line is, is a multiple of samples if you do a non-interpolating read, right? Because it just gives you the exact sample that was some number of samples in, in the past. And what that number of samples was was 2.35 times 44.1, because there are 44.1 samples in a millisecond, and there are 2.35 milliseconds in the delay line. That thing rounded to the nearest integer, rounded, is the length of the delay line. And you can hear. Actually, I wonder if we can still hear what's going on. Yeah. Uh, you can actually hear the grain, the granularity of, of the possible delays you can get. You hear little several times J and D differences there? Or to put it another way, uh, suppose I want to tune this to my nice uh, 440 hertz oscillator. Well, that's not good because I can probably get it to exactly 440.1, can't I? <laughs> so let's see if we can tune it to middle C. Not middle C, but some C. Uh, how do I make C? Uh, let's see. MIDI to frequency. Oscillator. Yeah, plus 0.15. Cosine, I think I told you this nonsense before. This is so that you can easily tune to it. And now that I've done that, I can actually just say, well, all right, 60, 72. Okay, what does that sound like? All right, now I'm going to try to tune to that. That's too low, that's too high. That's as close as I'm going to get. And it's not on. And you could say, well, that's pretty good, but it's not computer music. Computer music ought to be good to six digits, so this is not. Well, I can tell you exactly how good this is. Uh, this is uh, 1.91 milliseconds, which corresponds to about 500-something hertz, 520-ish, 530-ish. And um, anyway, 1.91 milliseconds is 110 samples-ish long. So what that means is that if I cut a sample off, I'm cutting it by, I'm increasing the frequency by about 1%, which is about a sixth of a half tone, because a half tone is 6%. So I have, you know, sixth of a half tone accuracy in, in the kind of pitch that I can make in this delay line. So um, the papers came rolling out of Stanford because, of course, they wanted you to be able to put these in synthesizers and... Um, uh, there turned out to be techniques for sort of making fractional delays that would still work. There's one in, in PD, but it's actually not suitable for this. It's called VD, which is the variable delay line. And if I ask for one of those, the naming convention is about the same as in V line. It's just the variable one. And I guess I'll just give it the same thing, 0.92. And what do I have now? Silence. Oh. 
uh, what I did wrong was when I, I didn't do anything wrong, when I typed the new name of the object in there, that destroyed the old object and created a new one. And for some reason that, oh, but wait, there's nothing wrong with that. We've got 120 decibels worth of stuff going around this delay line. So what's happened now is we got DC buildup that has exceeded the rest of everything that's there. Oh, so let me tell you about that. <laughs> Here's the thing. Um, uh, let's see. Let's make this be 99%. And now let's see if we can actually, oh, here it's gone away. And now I can say sound. Um, if I, um, now if I make the thing blow up again, Well, everything is cool until a certain amount of time passes and a thing happens, which is this. Um, the, the frequencies that are present in this sound are multi, it's approximately tuned to middle C, so just call it middle C for now. So, it's, so the frequencies that, are, that, can, that resonate this way are zero, middle C, twice middle C, three times middle C, and so on, all the harmonics of middle C. The reason those frequencies are the ones that are in this are in this waveform is because it's a repeating waveform and the waveform is repeating at a fixed period and therefore the possible frequencies that that waveform can be are DC and then all the all the partials of that fundamental, right? But now there's a problem which is that I've got a low pass filter in here which is letting DC in at full blast and is letting the other partials through at slightly less than full blast. So that compared to DC, the harmonics are decaying very slightly. And once they have decayed very slightly and very gently for long enough, they will get to the point where DC will push everything outside of the ring. Well, that's right, yeah. It'll get to the point that DC will push the thing up against the top of the range, 10, and nothing else will be able to vibrate. I can hasten that because I'm not sure how long it's going to take. It seems to take differing amounts of time each time. But see, we still got 120 or 119 dB. We had 120 dB when it was being quiet, but I can now make it happen faster by low passing it only at 1,000 hertz instead of 5,000. Ooh, and it shut it up right away. So what's in the delay loop right now is 120 dB worth, and the numbers, if you look at them, are just going to be 10. It's just going to be top of top of the range, and why ten? Because we're clipping from minus ten to ten. It's the it's the range. It's the clipping range that we've set for the loop. So our delay line has stopped making music and is now just making DC. All right. Questions about what I'm doing here? All right. Why would you care about ever making an unstable delay line in the first place? Well, <laughs> the thing is, once you um, once you get around these fundamental problems of making it go silent and things like that, uh, then you can make this into a very powerful class of synthesizers, which, um, which don't sound like Carpal Strong because the nonlinearities that you have to do to make the thing not blow up shape the sound in, in various possibly easy to control and possibly hard to control ways, depending on what you've done. And the gotcha is that if you don't do it right, you'll end up with this outcome and you will not be happy. So there are things that you need to know how to do to, to do that. What I'm going to try to do is save that for next time because that's a whole other topic and go back into nice, safe, linear delay network building for right now so that, um, uh, so that this, there can be a logical sequence to what's going on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, was that partially a limitation of the muscle resolution? Um, if we have mm. time to, could we have gotten higher resolution? I don't think so, because uh, it was going up by hundreds of a millisecond. Or to put it another way, uh, one point, at, at this, in this range, that, that's a change of about a half a percent, because it's about one in one one hundredth out of two. And the delay line is only 100 samples long. So there are at least a couple of mouse clicks per uh, per delay time change. But if I had, yeah, in, in a de for longer delays, actually the mouse would be the controlling thing and not the delay line length, I think. No, it, 
get sure about that. It bothers me. No, it's not true at all. <laughs> a, um, one sample is 0.2 milliseconds, no matter what the length of it. So adding one, adding one sample is always adding 0.2 milliseconds. 0.2 milli, sorry, 0 0.02 milliseconds, because the sample rate is, corresponds to a 22 microsecond sample. And this is the tens of microseconds here, so we're okay, <laughs> but only just barely. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So um, back to linear uh, linear delay networks. Um, so there there is another matter which uh, I need to talk about, which is this. So let's um, put this back up to something higher, and I'll make this just just be a hundred percent now. Actually, let's make it be nothing so we clear it out and then give ourselves a nice tone. Let's see, does this work? Yeah. Okay. Notice now it's losing energy slightly because of this filter. The, uh, theoretically, if this filter weren't in here, this would be lasting forever, but the filter is, is seeing to it that the highs are gradually being attenuated. So I have only a certain amount of time to carry this out, so let's just go ahead and do it. So what's the top pitch I can possibly get? So anything below 1.46, actually, ish, 1.47, and it stops increasing in pitch. Why is that? That's because of PD's blocking, right? PD has a, um, and this is something that some people have trouble understanding, other people don't, and I don't know why. I don't know a good way to explain this. The, what I've discovered is that when I try to explain it, people who didn't understand it before I started still don't understand it after I've explained it. <laughs> so, um, but I'm going to just explain it anyhow because I'm so, um, because I'm mad at my tablet or whatever you call this thing. There, so we're getting escape out. Now we're going to open whatever the previous thing was. All right. Uh, hey, come here. And then I think I say plus. Oh, where's the plus? All right. All right. So, um, right. So delay lines. How do they work? Well, okay. So samples. How do they work? Well, uh, samples are sort of like this. You. Oh, it's already horrible. All right, here we go. So samples look, <laughs> yeah, come here. It's out of control. Come here. <sighs> there we are. All right. So, um, right. So sample computation looks something like this. You have stuff. Well, all right. You have. Uh, an array. <laughs> yeah, I, I, that, that represents the fact that the numbers are changing in value. <laughs> and, and of course, what you really do is you, um, uh, is you do computations on a certain block of the array, and then later on you do computations on the next block of the array and so on. So, for instance, suppose you read something out of a delay line and do something to it and then put the stuff back in the delay line. Well, you read it out here, and then you do something to it, and then you want to put it back in the delay line, but the sample at which you put it back, yeah, oh, I, I'm not explaining this well, because you can't, um, you can't put it back in these samples because you've already used them, or rather that time has already passed by the time. Or to put it another way, you've already gotten those out of the delay line. <laughs> those are these samples that you're crunching with. So the next sample in the delay line after this one is this one. And so if you do something to something in the delay line and then put the result back in the delay line, the result goes back in at least one block later in time. You can put it in later than that if you want, but you can't put it in any less late than that. And what that means in terms of a patch is whenever you make 
uh, something that is read and then stuff and then write. You know, this this could look like, as if it's a loop that has no delay in it, but it in fact always has at least one block of samples in it. Now, why does uh, why does anyone actually compute samples in blocks then? Well, uh, there's a <sighs> there's a stupid reason and a profound reason. The stupid reason is that um, it costs a lot less in many ways of computing audio samples to compute them in blocks than it does to compute them in individual samples. And that's the thing about um, that's the thing about computer technology, which doesn't have any particular meaning. What it is is, is this: if you want to if you want to make a, 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 a digital synthesizer that is patchable, that's to say that, that has modules that you can reconfigure, the way you do it, you got two choices. Either you can compile the thing that you've made down to code, down to, down to machine code, or else you can make a subroutine for each one of them and then just jump to the subroutines, which is called interpre interpretive. It's, it's an interpreter when you do this to, to a piece of code, right? So you can so in, in this patch, to go back to look at the patch, what, what pure data could do is it could actually make a bunch of C code that corresponds to one sample's worth of this computation, and then it could call the C compiler, and then it could dynamically load the code in, and assuming it doesn't crash, then it would run that thing, and it would actually be operating on a block size of one sample. But what PD in, instead does is the more convenient and perhaps more robust thing uh, in terms of, uh, of software engineering which is it simply has a subroutine that's, that's V-line tilde, a subroutine that's noise tilde, and so on. But then, when you call, the, the overhead of getting that subroutine started is typically about 20 samples worth of computation. In other words, V-line tilde with one sample costs about, uh, costs about a third of what V-line tilde with 64 samples does. But instead of 64 samples, you only got one sample. So, what you do is you give it 64 samples of work at a time in order to um, in order to make the overhead of getting from call to call not to dominate completely the, the computation time. And it literally is a factor of something like 20 on, on the last hardware that I actually tried it out on. I don't try this very often because it's so depressing. So, um, so uh, PD just sort of makes it a reasonable default of 64 samples per block. Which, um, so there's about 20 samples worth of overhead, which means that it's really only running at about 75% of the efficiency that it would if we had block sizes of a million, say. But the thing about a block size of a million is, going back here, you would never be able to have any kind of a looping structure that had less than a million elements in it, which is not terribly good. And also, you would get into situations where uh, line tilde, which, you know, having line tilde jiggle, you know, jitter by a millisecond and a half is not so bad. Millisecond and a half is corresponds to 64 samples. Right. So a mill, millisecond and a half of uncertainty in line segments is fine for most term, you know, most volume control kinds of applications. In fact, most envelope generators. But if that were, say, a thousand samples, then it wouldn't be so great at all. You wouldn't be able to make a rise time that was less than a thousand samples, for instance. And that would be you know, that would be ugly. So 64 is a, is a compromise, and it's a compromise that you'll be happy with until you hit one of its limitations. And I've shown you now two places where that limits you. One is, one was when I was fooling around with line tilde making these, um, making these pulses that turned out to require V-line. And the other is what I'm showing you right now, which is that I made this delay loop and I was unable to get the delay loop to be less than 64 samples long. Actually, it's a little bit worse than that uh, because I'm using um, interpolating delay. It's actually, um, the interpolating delay to to get a value out, it has to have uh, four points to interpolate between, so that in fact you lose another, I think, one or two samples, and so it's that actually the, the smallest loop you can get is 65 or 66 samples, something like that. Well, okay, so let's make there be a block size of one, and now we get to the deep issue. The deep issue is that. Um, Okay, if, you, if you're not doing any interpolation at all, you can make a delay loop. If you're, if you're computing audio sample by sample instead of block by block, you can make delay loops that actually affect the next sample. In other words, the loop has a one sample delay inside. But that's a problem because what if you wanted less than one sample? 
well, why would you want less than one sample? Well, for instance, if you try to make a Moog filter, um, you know, if you try to take the analog circuit that's a Moog filter and, and you try to just make that feedback path with its one sample delay, you'll find that that one sample delay detunes the Moog filter and messes up the resonance. Because one sample is actually a substantial amount of delay in, in, in the filter world. It's enough delay to change phases of stuff and, ma and make stuff add up differently and change sounds. So actually, if 64 samples was too much, maybe one sample is too much. And the other thing is it's not just one sample necessarily because, again, if I am doing any kind of interpolation in the delay read, I'm still going to get the delay that's inherent in that interpolation, which is an additional, I think, I think the least you can possibly get is an additional one sample of delay. So actually the minimum you could get is two samples if you're doing four-point interpolation. Which is, you know, well, you'll, well, two samples. All right, so if I was going, if I was um, back here and I said, all right, I'm going to get down to a two-sample delay in this network. Uh, two-sample delay corresponds to what frequency? Anyone? It has a, it has a name. <laughs> Some engineer... <laughs> Nyquist. <laughs> Two samples period is the Nyquist frequency. So I'm actually going to be able to make delay loops go all the way up to the Nyquist frequency with four-point interpolation. But if I had eight-point interpolation, then, I'm not, then I wouldn't be able to. All right. Okay, next thing is how do, you, how do you do this? Since I've just told you that you couldn't. Um, so let's just do it. Let's see. Yeah, we got time. Oh, sure. We're in great shape. Okay, so what you do is you just make a, por uh, a portion of the patch that has a one sample delay in it. And the way you do that is this. Um, make a sub patch and give it a reasonable name, like a, a different block, block size. Small block. Small block size. Let's be explicit. All right. And in small block size, in this one, I'm going to put an object special object called block tilde. And I'm going to ask it to block at one sample. Block tilde is the sort of, well, block tilde is, is the way that you get around weird block size limitations in, in PD. Um, you're allowed to use any power of two that you want. Uh, why power of two? That's to guarantee that everything is a sub or super multiple of the block size in the parent patch so that there isn't pages and pages of bookkeeping to do. Um, so is one, is one the power? Or is one is a power of two. Oh, yeah, one is the number. So it can be one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and so on so like that. So you put like 17 in there or 18 in there? I, yeah, I forgot what it does. It should complain. It didn't complain. It complained about something else earlier. In fact, uh -oh. oh yeah, that's nothing. Huh, it's just doing it for me. I guess it's just silently rounding it. <laughs> that's not terribly good. <laughs> that's not good style. Anyway, one is a good block size. Oh, you know what? That's a feature. If you're doing TV rasters, you don't want to have to use powers of two. So if you're using these tilde objects to make TV rasters, which you should never do, then um, your block size might want to be, for instance, one raster line or even a one raster or something like that. And so the, the thing that I forgot to mention was if you don't have any inlet tilde or outlet tilde objects, you can make the block size whatever you want. And semantics get funny. But as long as you're not copying signals into and out of the real audio world, then then you can have a free hand. Yeah. So I think what'll happen is it'll it'll put off complaining until. Oh, that's that's a bug, by the way. I shouldn't or a mistake. You can't have more than one block tilde object because it's a declaration about the entire window. And now if I say inlet, it will not have any idea how to do the inlet. Inlet tilde. Yeah, it's just do. It's just saying cool, but it's not cool. <laughs> anyway, but all right. To get back to reality here, let's not do video today. No, just one quick question. Yeah. Can you have a DAC object in there? No. Oh, thanks. Yes, there are things that hate each other. Block tilde and DAC tilde and ADC tilde hate each other. And 
I've, it never would have occurred to me to put a DAC tilt inside a blocked window because it just would feel so horrible. But <laughs> apparently people try it once in a while and they find out that it doesn't work. Um, and I can't remember, I hope there's, I hope I've actually put a message in about that, but. Uh, no, I think, oh, wait a second, is, is DSP on? Oh yeah, oh I see, yeah, there we go. It hates me. Uh, in fact, that, okay, so DSP being off was perhaps why it didn't smack me about this. No, it really is trying to do that even though it can't be done. All right, okay, so now, now that I have block one, okay, so I can get stuff into and out of this window just by saying inlet tilde and outlet tilde. I've been doing that already, so I should have just done it and stopped doing that. So here, here is a patch that does nothing, All right? So now we've got a small block size and an input and output so now what I'll do is I'll take this same impulse that I'm making here, put it into my small block size patch, and now I'll copy all this stuff inside there. And maybe I don't need that. Oh, but I need this, and this, and this. Maybe I'll keep this anyway, just for fun. Okay, copy, paste, warning. Oh, Sue is multiply defined. Yes, right. Uh, all right. Male's turn, Ted. Oh, that's bad because that rhymes with Fred. We're going to get confused. Well, all right, let's put it as. Um, okay, what am I forgetting? The inlet is going to get. The, okay, we don't want to do nothing. We want to take whatever goes in here and, and insert it in the delay loop by adding it here. And then the outlet is just going to be what's in the delay loop, like this. Maybe after clipping, just, you know, like that. Okay. So now what's going on is uh, variable delay read, uh, gain, low pass filter, uh, envelope, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And now, theoretically, let's see, I can send this all the way up to 100. Give this a real delay. Oh, that's in 10. Now give it a pulse. It's all turned off. Oh, and it's doing something, but now I need to connect something to the outlet. No, we don't need this stuff anymore, do we? And yeah, there it is. And now I should be able to do ridiculous stuff with this. Yeah, except, yeah, <laughs> that's higher than I was able to get before. <laughs> Woo! -hoo. Okay, that is too high. There's something. Yeah, so this is kind of past the limit of what you really would ask Carpal Strong to do. Well, here what's happening now is that the low pass filter is low passing every time the signal goes around. Well, okay, you can think of there being a signal that goes around the delay line repeatedly, although that's maybe that's maybe not a good way to think about it in every for every point of view. But it's one thing that you can do. So you can say that the si signal gets filtered by this low pass every 0.2 milliseconds now, so it doesn't last terribly long at all. So then I would have to play games with getting an even gentler low pass than LOP tilde can do. And the way you do that is, in fact, I'll have to do that next time, so I'll get into that when it's time to get into that. All right. So this is now a carpless strong and small block size delays. There you go. Right. Um, that, uh, that 64 samples, which was 1.45 milliseconds, that corresponds to about 780 hertz, as I recall. This is at 44K1, right? Which is not very high. That's, you know, a little bit above middle C. So when you're doing recirculating delay-ish stuff, you pretty frequently want to get into this kind of a sub-window scene. All right, questions about this? I think it's time for me to close this patch and now use the small block size trick to make a low-pass filter, which is the first thing that they make you do in DSP. Actually, the first thing they make you do in DSP is, is uh, average a signal with a, uh, with itself with a one sample delay, but I'm not going to do that because it's kind of sad, and I'll just do the recirculating one right away because it's going to be good. 
Oh, and I'm just remembering. Um, what we'll do is, instead of starting with a low pass, I'll start with just a comb filter and then make it into a low pass later because that will be a more logical order of, well, progression of ideas. Okay, so I'm going to save this and now make a new one, which is now going to be two, um, I don't know, comb filter. Yes, I'm not sure if that's the right name to, to use or not. Okay. And now, um, let's go back to using the metronome to generate our pulses. And I'm going to get rid of this. So I get rid of that, get rid of that, get rid of that. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's all working. Good. Okay. Um, actually, let's just shut that up for a second. Um, okay, another way of thinking about this Let's, um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to quit using the variable delay line and use a straight ahead non-interpolating one for a reason which I guess I will see if I can demonstrate. First off, I'm going to get rid of the low pass filter, give it a healthy gain, but not 100 now, about 99.9, .9, big gain, and um, I don't know, 10 milliseconds again. All right, that's not what I wanted to have happen. There we go. Notice that there is filtering still going on. All right? So this signal loses, loses high frequencies as it goes on in time. Uh, and the higher the, free, the higher the pitch I push it to, the stronger that effect will be. So. Yeah, except it's not uniform. I have no good way of predicting it. What's happening is that the low-pass filtering, this is a four-point low-pass filtering thing, exactly like the table read object, tab read four. Um, if you took a signal and delayed it by, say, one and a half samples by interpolating between pairs of samples, and if you think about what that would do to a sinusoid, is it would replace the sinusoid by little segments and draw the points in the middle of the segments. And the higher the frequency of the sinusoid was, the more it would reduce the amplitude because the cutting the thing in, because replacing the thing with segments, even if the segments are, are cubic curves like it is with tab read four, the segments don't flesh out the sine wave. There's some loss of gain in there because of the interpolation. Because interpolation doesn't doesn't deal with curves, it, it it likes to cut corners or it likes to cut in the, cut on the inside of curves, right? So what what that means is that uh, variable delay doesn't have a perfectly flat frequency response. If you give it DC, it'll give you an exact result because interpolating a constant, you get the constant back. But if you give it something that has curvature, then you will lose some some energy in the interpolation. So in fact, um, there is a horrible trade-off between how many points interpolation you want you have to calculate and what kind of frequency response you want the thing to have. You'll never get a flat frequency response. Four points, you get a pretty good frequency response, but up at Nyquist, you're, you're losing a few dB. And um, for that reason, what I'm now going to do is get rid of my variable delay object and just get a delay read again. And now, let's just give the same number. Now I should have no filtering at all. Yeah, so in, in fact, if I made this thing be 100 now, I would have something that would play forever. And of course, you've already heard that, so I'm not going to do it to you. All right, and now, now that we have a del read instead of a variable delay, we can actually get the delay time all the way down to one sample because there's no interpolation. And we're only blocking at one sample here. But the first thing I want to do is go back and just play with variable delay lines for a moment. So I'll give it 100 milliseconds so that what this thing does is this. Now let's give it a gain like that. And now we have this kind of thing. 
By the way, each of those sounds different because <laughs> I get a different sample of noise every single time. And that was why I wanted to go back. That's why I wanted to be doing this so that it wouldn't do that. <laughs> Let's hope it doesn't do that. Yeah, good. So now we have something that's perfectly repeatable. And in fact, if I wanted that to be noisy, I would have to add some FM or something and I could do it. But let's not go too deep into that. This is a good enough thing to start out with. So now, um, question. This is, by the way, a slight digression, but only very slight. Um, what if you didn't like those echoes and wanted to get rid of them? What would you do? Well, it's easy. Uh, we know how long the delay is. It's a, it's ten. Sorry, it's 100 milliseconds, and we know the gain. It's 80 percent. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it another delay. It doesn't have to be in there. This, this is well. Uh, there's more to say about that, but I'm not going to say it just now. So now I'm going to now what I'm going to do is write this into a delay. And I'll give it, um, I don't know, I'll give it a hundred, uh, I'll give it the, the usual size, but then I'll just say to read out of the, i read out of it after 100 milliseconds. And now I'm going to take that and multiply it by 0 0.8. That, that's the 80% that you have over here. And I'm just going to subtract that from the original. Right? This could never work, of course. So just to just to prove to you that my fingers are at no point leaving my hands, I will listen to this signal. That's what we're putting in there. And here's what comes out. made an anti-reverberator. <laughs> this cannot be done. Um, <laughs> the, the reason I got away with this, uh, okay, the reason I got away, there are two things. There's, there's the reason I was able to get away with this and there's the reason I, I'm doing this. And those are two things I have to try to explain. The reason I was able to get away with this is because I knew exactly what the delay line was and the delay line actually happened to be an invertible one. You can make delay networks that are not invertible, and I'm not going to try to get into how to do that just yet. But these are these uh, recirculating delay networks that have that simply have the output recirculating to the input with percentage, as long as it's less than one. Uh, you well, you can just do it via pure thought, right? So think about what this signal is. It's it's a it's a succession of copies of this pulse spaced out 100 milliseconds, and each one is 0.8 times the previous one in height. So now just take that entire pulse train and slide it over 100 milliseconds and drop it by 0.8, and it exactly matches all the echoes except the first one. And then subtract it out, and then you've gotten rid of everything except the first thing, and then you have inverted the delay line. And then you've got that. All right? Now, this is useless because... Um, the next thing you should do is uh, try to do this... Uh, Try to do this if you've got some kind of, uh, you know, feedback problem in a room. Or like if you don't like the fact that you have a recording and the recording has reverberation in it, why don't you just do this and subtract out the reverberation? It doesn't work because um, I, th I think theoretically it could be made to work, but the thing is you can't measure the reverberation exactly. Like, no one is going to tell you what the exact impulse response of the reverberation in such a way that you could then hope to subtract it back out. Um, it's a little bit worse than that because the it might actually be the case that it isn't even invertible because one of the, well, to, to, to oversimplify, if one of the echoes is louder than the, than, the, than the original sound, then you try to subtract it out, but you have to subtract something out that's bigger than the original and it's not going to work. It's going to be unstable. So, um, so I, I was depending on the fact that it was a proper invertible delay network, but I'm also depending on the fact that I know exactly what the delay network is, and in a real room you can't measure that. And, well, of course, you could believe that you could measure it except for one thing, which is this. 
when the noise source in the room moves by as much as a tenth of an inch, <laughs> that will change the reverberation transfer function of the reverberation impulse response sufficiently that whatever you did to try to subtract the impulse response out will no longer work. And okay, that's fine. What we'll do is we'll just strap the singer down so that she can't even move by one tenth of an inch. And then it still won't work because the air in the room won't stay still. And the temperature of the air in different parts of the room is different. And as the air sort of swaps places, the length of the delay times change slightly. And so the impulse response to the room, in fact, is not constant in time. So that's an excellent research project for someone to uh, waste their life on. It's trying to uh, uh, get rid of rever reverberation in real situations. This, uh, this technique uh, makes it seem easier than it really would be. Uh, I think there are people who are selling products that claim to do this. <laughs> and I don't, I, I don't believe they work terribly well. And at any rate, it's impossible, theoretically impossible for them to work perfectly. <laughs> and anyway, you can cheat. You can cheat just by noise gating the signal <laughs> and make people believe that you're getting rid of the reverb when in fact all you're really doing is noise gating. And that's what I think they do when they sell you these things. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, now, what was... Okay, so the reason that I'm telling you this is something different from what all that was, which is this. Um, it might be interesting to know what the frequency response of this network was. Why? Because, uh, in fact, all of the... All digital filters are... Well, that's not quite true. All digital filters are some combination of things like this and things like that. And by the way, this thing is the inverse of that thing. So all filters are either finite impulse response, things like this, or infinite impulse response, things like that, or combinations of different ones of them. Not the same one, because it would cancel out, but, but an IR of one thing and an FIR with some other coefficient, say, something like that. All right. Um, so. So that's cool. Now, supposing you want to be able to design filters for specific frequency responses that you would like, how would you do that? Well, this is how you do filter design. What you do is you figure out what the frequency response is of this, which is easy because all it is doing, well, relatively easy, because all it's doing is, is superposing the signal with a delayed copy of itself. And you can just figure out for any frequency that you put in how those two things would add up and what the, what the amplitude of the result would be. And since you know that that's the inverse of this, then you know that the frequency response of this is exactly the opposite or the reciprocal of the frequency response of that. And now you know the frequency response of any filter. Or rather, you know how to get it. Hmm. That's pulling a fast one in a couple of respects. You could, of course, make some horrible network here that had more, a more complicated recirculating path than just a single recirculating loop, and then you would cause yourself much more trouble and then you know then you could take a graduate class in double E and learn learn how to do these things really. But what I'm telling you is just how to do it in a good enough way to do solve seat of the pants computer music problems. Alright. Uh, it is let's see, I think it's let me do one more thing and then it's kind of break time. The one more thing that I want to do is this. Um, Let's go back to this and start talking about the frequency response again. Let's see. Uh, oh, right. We have the gain down rather low. So this is the this is the one with the echoes. Where'd the echoes go? Uh, what am I doing? Oh, that was much louder, and this is much quieter. Maybe there it is. All right. So that, of course, as we know, if we start pushing this into funny territories. Oh, that's a mistake. Or that's silly because this is going at 100 hertz and I set this to 100 hertz. Let's go back to the noise. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, well, whatever. Anyway, um, so this, is, this I presume is 100 hertz because I set this thing to 10 milliseconds. Um, and it has resonances at 100 hertz and 200 hertz and 300 hertz and so on. Um, if I, and DC, of course, gets, get, goes through full blast. A thing that doesn't go through terribly well 
is, um, sorry, is 50 hertz. If I give it 50 hertz, all right, so the, so the experiment here should be this. I should, now, um, this is, oh, let's see. Let's leave the, uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm fighting with myself about whether I should add more stuff to this patch or start over with something else, but I'll keep going just a little bit because this is worth it. All right, so now we're going to say oscillator 50 hertz, say. Well, actually, I'm going to give it various values, so I'm going to just say number box. And now, just for, uh, what's the right word? Just to know, let's see what the output of this thing is in decibels. This is a number you should all know by heart. Uh, it's wrong. <laughs> That's not the number. That's the number. Uh, 97. 97 dB, well, 97 dB out of 100 is the loudness of an, of an oscillator whose peak amplitude is 1. Because if your peak amplitude is 1, your RMS amplitude is 1 over the square root of 2. And then you do 10 times the log to the base 10 of the square root of 2, and it's 3. So you lose 3 decibels, and so you get there. My reason for doing that is to compare that number with what happens when you run this through this network. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> I forgot we were listening to it, but that's all right. Why do we hear anything? Oh, yeah, I know. Okay, and now we'll start looking at what happens on the output. So I'll just get another one of these things. And we get something lower. How much lower? Well, we can find out by just kind of subtracting. Uh, this is, by the way, being a little sloppy because I don't know what order these two numbers are coming in, but um, I don't care because uh, those numbers aren't changing in time. So as soon as it settles down, we get this number. So right now it has a gain of, I should do it the other way, sorry. I want to, have, I want to say that it has a gain of minus 5 decibels. So you, you take the output and subtract the input to see what the gain was. There we go. Okay, is it clear what I'm doing? I'm just measuring the frequency response of this thing, right? If I say, all right, that's a nice oscillator. Let's try uh, 100 hertz instead. It'll get a lot louder, so let's turn this down. Uh, <laughs> much louder. Gain of 110 hertz. Uh, sorry, 100, uh, gain of 13 point, uh, 14 dB. Furthermore, if I give it a multiple of 100 hertz, I guess I will get the same thing. Yep. And in fact, even zero, except zero is going to be a little special. First off, it sounds different from the others. And the second thing is, um, depending on exactly what phase it was at, I'll get a different number here and a different number there. But still, the difference is still going to be the same 14 dB. So what I have is a filter, which has a gain of respectable gain of 14 dB at every peak of 100 hertz. And, it, and between peaks, say at 50, it has this gain of minus 5. So it's got a 20 dB gain compared to its, the trough that it gets at 5 hertz. OK? And this is just me measuring this. Now, if I wanted to compute this, I would, I would, um, uh, I would think about this network and start writing down formulas that would have trig in them, but then I would get these exact answers. So try that sometime if you want to see something actually work out. Um, okay, now, um, going back to, okay, why, why is it a peak every 100 hertz? It's because uh, I set the delay time to be 1 100th of a second. Uh, what if I don't want there to be peaks at every 100 hertz? What if I just don't want any peaks at all except for DC so that I have a low pass filter. Well, uh, just jump to the solution. If I set this thing to be one sample, which I can do, by the way, by saying zero. <laughs> yeah, let's lose this. Uh, if I ask it to do a delay of zero, it will, as you saw before, it was unable to make a delay of less than one block. In this context, one block is one sample, so it, it's now a delay of one sample because it's the minimum it can make. All right. I'm being sloppy. I could actually compute what a sample is in milliseconds, but I can just tell it zero and it'll do a one sample delay. Now, the first resonant frequency, well, besides DC, 
is the frequency that corresponds to a period of one sample. That is not the Nyquist, that is the sample rate. That's a frequency of 44K1, which is exactly the same thing as a frequency of zero. But we already knew it had a peak at the frequency of zero. So in fact, it only has one peak, which is at zero. All the other peaks are just aliased copies of zero in, in, in sampled frequency land. So what I've made here is a low pass filter. And to prove that to your ears, I can do this. Let's get this noise thing out here. Let's turn this way down and just pump this with noise. And here's, oh yeah, but you need to be able to hear the, end of it, the original noise too. Oh, which is here because it's still, no, it's not still the inverse because I haven't fixed this. So let's now do this. Wait, I want, the, I want to hear the noise as a comparison. Here's noise. Here's result of low-pass filter. And furthermore, that low-pass filter changes when I change this percentage. So if I say zero, it does nothing, so we get the original noise. And if I push it up, it progressively filters it progressively filters harder and harder until I say a hundred, at which point it does something that's not really exactly reasonable. <laughs> um, specifically, what it will do then is it will integrate this signal. It'll just compute a, it'll just compute a running sum of everything that goes into it, <laughs> and so eventually it will blow up. It won't be won't be a terribly satisfying filter. But anything below exactly a hundred, and you've got yourself a low pass filter. Mm, there's a little bit of a problem here because the low-pass filter has a huge gain at DC. So if we look at these gains now, oh wait, I have to go back to using the oscillator now. So let's um, let's get rid of the noise, give it the oscillator, and then I can investigate the frequency response more reasonably. So. What goes in is 97 dB, and what comes out is 119, and we got a gain of 22 at 50 hertz. <laughs> okay, so let's give this now this 0.8 that we had before. Sorry, 80, which turns into 0.8. Right. And now, uh, as before, if I give it zero frequency in, I have this gain of 14 dB. That's the same gain that I got when I set the recirculation gain to 80 but had the delay time at 10. Now the delay time is, is at zero. I still get the same gain at the one peak that's remaining, but at any other frequency there's no peak. And so as I increase the frequency of this oscillator, this gain should drop. And as you see it's dropping. It started out at 14, now it's at 13.5. Uh, what's, so at some point it'll drop by 3 dB, and that'll be, let's see, was it 14? So if I get this down to 11, I will have found the 3 dB point of this filter. It's about 2 kilohertz-ish, 1,500 hertz. Both of these ENV tildes would say minus infinity. Actually, they would say minus 1500 because PD hates infinity. Um, and then you wouldn't get a good measurement. And in fact, That's there's no way you could measure a filter by putting nothing in. <laughs> right. But if, yeah, it did happen to it. Yeah, but if it was even a thousandth of the way into the cycle, then it would be non zero, and then, then we're floating points, so it would be happy. So, yeah, you would have to work hard to get that to happen. Right. Questions about this? This is now where we should take a cigarette break. <laughs> Except that I'm not condoning your smoking cigarettes. <laughs> take a marijuana break. One uh, matter that will appear minor, but which will become important or at least interesting later about uh, the, these low pass filters is the phase response. And this again is the thing about the kid on the swing set I was saying earlier, except here, we're, uh, this is not a resonant filter, this is just a 
low pass filter. Ooh, I should show you the impulse response too. That would be, well, maybe we could leave that for some DSP class later. Um, but the phase response is interesting. The, this is, um, the low pass filter you can think of as a, um, as a moving average, as a, you put something in and it averages it in with whatever its previous output was so that as you just keep on nailing it with the same number, it tracks that number. It's a tracking device essentially, right? And uh, the speed at which it settles, the speed at which it reaches a new value that you put in is uh, essentially one over the, um, one over the uh, cutoff frequency of the low pass filter or roll off frequency is what you sometimes would call it. The, um, if you think of it as a tracking device, it's, it's a thing where if you put a voltage in, it will actually exponentially approach that voltage. This, that's not a thing that I've told you why yet, but that's, that's a thing about another point of view on this. Then the speed at which it tracks the incoming, the, the speed at which it approaches the thing, that's, a, that's a, a time constant. And that time constant is one over the roll off frequency of the low pass filter. Or to put it more exact, it's proportional to one over the roll off because there's probably a two pi to throw in there somewhere. Um, depending, okay, so what I'm doing now is I'm feeding the low pass a disgustingly low frequency and it is showing you, unfortunately I've got the sign messed up in my XY plotter um, so that uh, Y is negated, which it shouldn't be. Let me fix this. I don't really want to have the sign be wrong. Oh, yuck. I don't want to understand this patch anymore. Anyway. <laughs> all right, I guess all I have to do is go in here and just say times minus one. times tilde minus one. This is not really the correct way to do this. <laughs> the correct way to do it would be to understand how this patch works and <laughs> actually do so. Okay, so now what I'm doing is I'm, I'm uh, making a graph. Here, here's the XY plot uh, sub patch here. This is from last time. This is the thing that I was making the, the epicycles with. Uh, now what I'm doing is I'm, um, on the X axis I'm showing uh, the oscillator that's going in and on the y-axis, I'm showing the oscillator that's going out. And mirabile dictu, I'm giving it 22 hertz, and the cutoff frequency is 1500, as I measured it. So uh, no surprise, it's not doing anything to the signal, which is to say you see everything happening along the line x equals y, input equals output. Right? The phase of the output is the same as the phase of the input. Or to put it another way, if I subtracted the two, I would get a very small signal. All right, um, okay, and as I push the frequency of it up, well, you know, as long as I'm below, say, a tenth of the resonant frequency, I'm not gonna see much change. But then at some point, something interesting will start happening, huh. unless it surprises me by never happening. What's going on? Do I have, this filter is doing nothing. For some reason, the signal that's going out is exactly the signal that's coming in. Probably, oh, here, <laughs> all right, very good. So I'm going to say zero and zero and point 0.8. I closed and reopened the patch. Sorry, that's 80, thank you. Ah, look at, the, oh, that's totally not what I wanted to see. This is an ellipse, right? <laughs> no. What is that? Oh, right. You know what I forgot to do? I forgot to fix the gain of the thing to be unity at zero. And here's how you fix the gain of the thing. You say, if I were zero going in, then, oh, actually, there, there are several ways of doing this, but the, the way I think about it is this. If I put um, a value of, this is, this is times 80, or times 80%. If I put 0.2 in here and multiply this by 0.80, I'll get 1. And then one will get multiplied by eighty and point two and so on. Point two is the is the value here that would um, that would give me an output of one because point two plus eighty percent is one. So the gain of this thing is one over twenty percent, which is five. And the reason I've worked out the gain is five because I put point two in and I get one out. And the reason Putting 0.2 in gives me one out is because 0.2 plus 0.8 is one. 
and one times 0.8 is 0.8 again. So that's all. That all explains how I can make the thing reach a steady state of one. So I. So to normalize this, what I should do is I should multiply here by one over one minus this value. And probably the correct way to do that is say, hey, no. As what did I just do? Okay. Come on, get in edit mode. Uh, I'm going to just cheat and say expert. Actually, expert isn't cheating. It's just calling out a calling out an object that I hate to show people because the syntax is so weird. So one over one minus dollar f one. And I'm even going to print that value out because I don't feel terribly confident about my expression mongering. And that hey. I'll repeat 80 there, and I get 5, gain of 5. So now I'll multiply this signal by 5 before I output it. Like this, times tilde. And now let's see what I just did to the plot. <laughs> I killed it. Oh, that's because I have to put this back in probably. There it is. And now it's still too big. Oh, wait, I didn't want to. Seems like I wanted to divide it by 5, didn't I? Yeah. So the thing is, I wanted to multiply it by 0.2. So really, this is a simpler expression. I don't even need the prints. Oh, this is stupid. All right, let's try that. 80, 0.2. Ha! Got it. <laughs> okay, so, the, so to correct this filter so that it has a unit gain, I multiply by 1 minus whatever the recirculated gain is. And that actually makes sense now that I say it in just a sentence. So why couldn't I have thought of that first? Okay, so now now I've actually got something with, that operates correctly when I give it very low frequencies. Now what comes out is what goes in. And then as I start increasing the frequency, not only do I see, well, not only do I see the output start to decrease, so now what's happening is the input is on the x-axis, it's still full amplitude, it still reaches the edge of the square, but the output is starting to droop a little bit, right? And it's not only starting to droop a little bit, but it's starting to droop. It, it's, this is not a line segment. It's not the case that the output is just 0.9 times the input now. The output is lagging behind the input in phase, as well as being smaller in amplitude. By how much? Well, that would take some trig. So let's just avoid the trig by just pushing it and seeing what we get. Oh, why is this happening? Now I'm getting very concerned because this is contradicting what I was going to tell you. Oh, that's wonderful, but it's not what we want. <laughs> um, what, the, what this is, <laughs> except that it isn't, is it's a approximately horizontal ellipse where the horizontal axis is still showing us the input, which should reach all the way up to 1. And I cannot figure out why that is not doing that. It must be because I'm I must be filtering somewhere inside here. Is there a filter in here? No. Huh. All right. Well, what I'm going to tell you is false because evidence is, is um, what's the right word? Evidence is contradicting my, the, uh, the, <laughs> the conclusion that I wanted to come to. Well, what you can see is that there's phase lag and that the output is losing amplitude. What I don't understand is why the input is losing amplitude as well. And that's something I'll go home and worry about later. Um, the, let's see. The thing is the output should be, uh, should be lagging the input by 90 degrees. And the a way that you can think of that would explain why the output would be lagging the input by 90 degrees is this. Um, in the extreme case, so I'm going to put a sinusoid into my nice low pass filter. Oops, sinusoid does not get vertical. But anyway, and then what comes out? Well, what comes out is something that starts rising when the thing is positive, reaches a maximum about here, and then starts decreasing to follow this part of the curve. So it continually decreases until it goes back through zero, and then it starts pulling it upward again, like that. 
So what I ended up drawing by, uh, by way of imitating what the output should be lagged the input by 90 degrees in the most extreme situation. The most extreme situation is where I, I set the uh, low pass, the, the, the roll off frequency far below the frequency of the sinusoid that I'm testing it with so that it doesn't have a chance to do anything except sort of lamely go up when the thing is positive and then lamely go down when the thing is negative. In which case, the output is 90 degrees later in phase than the input. And the reason I'm making so much, uh, so much of a do about that right now is because when it's time to study the Moog filter, the point of the Moog filter is to get the signal to, to make a feedback loop in which you choose a resonant frequency and fix that resonant frequency to be that at which the signal is 180, no, 360 degrees behind itself in phase. And there's a particular trick to that. Um, so, but that'll not happen for another couple of sessions. So, so filters have phase um, consequences as well as, as stuff that they do to amplitudes of signals. All right. Um, so this was a failed experiment. Let's just get rid of this and go talk about something more interesting. Okay. So the next thing to start wondering about is um, actually twofold, and I'm just going to develop these side by side because I don't know how to tell you which one should go first and which one should go second. So the, so the, things, the things are these. First off, um, this is cool and this is making low pass filters, but how would you make a resonant filter? And the second thing is um, uh, delay, this delay line was boring even when, when it had a link so that it was a comb filter because all it was able to do was make comb, comb filtery sounds. Like how would you make a reverberator? Well. A comb filter doesn't make a good reverberator because you hear the frequency of the comb filter. So what you want to do is make a more complicated recirculating delay network that sort of muddies up the um, muddies up the resonant frequency to the point that you don't hear it as being a resonant frequency. And to, to do both of these things, we need to be able to do recirculating delays with more than one delay line in one way or another. So, um, so what I want to do is just work up how you do that first as a general thing. Theory is not really a theory. General technique, general trick, <laughs> and then to um, uh, and then to work it out into some of the ramifications that it leads to. So the first thing is, let's say, uh, let's do a save. At, oh, do I really want to even follow this any further? Let's close this patch before it does something horrible to us. And open the one I was working on before. <laughs> And let's, let's make this be our starting point. So I'm going to save it as patch 5. Two delays. Okay, and two delays is going to be n delays. As soon as you can do two of something, you can probably do n of them. Well, not always, but probably. More often than not. Okay, so uh, the first thing that... Okay, so the first thing to talk about is this. Uh, assuming that we had... Well, the, the way to think about this in terms of making recirculating de delay networks is to think of pushing it to its extreme, which is to make the recirculating constant be one, so the thing rings forever in some way. And that's the thing that we've already done, and then we put an impulse in, and the thing just made an oscillator for us, which was cool. But now, the question would be, how would you set up a thing with more than one delay line in such a way that it would be able to recirculate forever? And the answer is not obvious at all. Uh, in fact, uh, it was independently discovered by um, bunches of people, but uh, the original discoverer of this was Michael Gerzen in, in England, who just seems to have discovered everything interesting about signal processing. And uh, the, the discovery went something like this. What you want to do is, is, know what, uh, is know that the power that you put into the delay write objects is equal to the power that you got out of the delay read objects. Well, there's a simple way of doing that, which is you just um, you just do it like this. Let's see. Uh, how about let's have two delay lines. <laughs> this is really terrible, but I'm going to call them Ted One and Ted Two. <laughs> it's a little Dr. Seuss-ish. Anyway, all right. So now I'm trying to clean this up so that I can make two of them and make it not be too ridiculous a patch to look at. Let's get this down here. 
Good. All right. I'm going to keep the block one, although we don't really need it right now. And so really what I'm doing is I'm wasting a lot of cycles making this thing be block one until I go back to make the delay think one again, which I'll want to do at some point. Okay. So now I'm going to duplicate this whole mess. And now this is going to be Ted two. This is stupid. I should do something like delay one and delay two. But all right. Inlet. Uh, this inlet is going to be the signal that uh, this this inlet is the signal that we're adding into the delay line. I'm going to add into both of them, although later on that won't matter so much. Right now it does matter because now I'm just going to make there be two delay lines and they will each be running in parallel. And I'll give them different delay times like this. 10 and 15 milliseconds and I'll give them, I don't know, 99% to start with. And now let's see what kind of a network we have. Okay, well, let's get rid of this. We don't need this stuff anymore. Do need that. Don't need that. Probably we'll get curious about that later. Now, two outlets. Do we? Re yeah. Okay. Let's do it. I'll just put the two outputs and two speakers. I don't know why. That might be a very bad idea. And now let's see what happens. Nothing. What am I doing wrong? Oh, I hear something. Probably, but I thought I had. I think there's something still stupid I'm doing. Let's see. See, all I'm really hearing is that. <laughs> well, look, here, I'm seeing these ridiculously low values. Oh, no, wait, that's. I'm seeing these huge values. That's really bad. Why is that thing doing that? Oh. What? Oh. <laughs> this is what I was warning you about earlier, <laughs> which is works fine until you allow DC to crowd the thing out. So what's, what we're doing now is DC has the thing pushed against the clip value so the thing isn't really operating correctly. Uh, I don't know really what to do about this, but what I'm going to do right now is I'm just going to say, let's not have anything below 10 hertz go in here. Wonderful reverberator, right? Well, it's a little bit better than the reverberator that I had before. Uh, and this is psychoacoustics. If I put these things within maybe a minor third of each other, then they would be within a critical band, and then I would, oh, let's actually leave that at 16 and push this up to 13. And then it would be very hard to hear the interval. Uh, I don't know, something like that. And then you, um, and then, you know, what I would really want to do is, Save this and go get the microphone on it and then show you how this works with the microphone and you will discover that I will immediately get ruinous feedback through the, through the speakers because the thing has huge gain at multiples of, of 100, well, at, at its resonant frequencies. And if you put something, if the thing, if there's any frequency at which there's a huge gain from mic to speaker, the, the microphone will find that gain and choose it to feedback at. And there's something I want to tell you about that. In fact, I should tell you this because I'm going to forget to tell you. And this is this is a key audio engineering trick. Um, this will make at least a couple of you really angry, but the rest of you will think it's cool. Um, so let's uh, let's go ahead and I'm going to save this and do something really ridiculous, which is this. I'm going to quit this PD. Two delays. I'm going to go over here where I've got PD running to do the recording. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask it to open my window. Yeah, that's, oh no, not sound recorder. I want files, two delays. Now I've actually got my microphone available that I can run into this patch. I'm going to pay for this. <laughs> All right, still working. <laughs> the problem is now I'm going to quit PD at some point when I get messed up and then it's going to stop recording and then I'm going to wish I hadn't done this. All right. Now I think now I believe I have an ADC. Let's see. ADC tilde and then I'm going to just check it out by 
amplifying it. Okay, and now do I have audio coming out? And this is, um, no, I do not. Pourquoi? Uh, test audio MIDI. We have audio coming in. Probably I need to do something, oh, like have more than zero channels of output. Oh, and when I do this, what's going to happen? Oh, it's all right. Okay. Hello? Is anything happening now? Yeah. Okay, so now I'm getting amplified. Very good. And now I'm going to get myself reverberated by taking this signal and putting it in here. And I guess it's okay now. Hey, come here. And now I've got myself a very bad, cheap reverberator. In fact, you can even sort of hear that there's reverberation going on. Although, if I want it to really reverberate well... Ooh, I'm sorry. It's not really reverberating at all. Okay, so careful here. I'm going to turn this off. Now I'm going to go back and put those numbers in. 16. And I think I was doing 80%. I'm not sure. And now let's ease this up and see if I can get myself reverberated. There it is. Ah, it's good. Now this is uh, Charles Dodge, um, any resemblance is purely coincidental reverberator, if you ever want to know how to do that. Um, it's a close relative of the Schroeder reverberator. The Schroeder reverberator is four of these with a little bit of extra fattening. And of course, if I do that, you hear just this, that's, uh, that would not be good room acoustics. Like if someone built a concert hall and it sounded like this, you would get mad. Right? Okay, the other thing about this is, as I mentioned, um, the gain is quite high at those resonant frequencies. So it's real easy to get feedback. So now, just, uh, just, so that, just so that you can never say that I never told you to do something that's really inappropriate, here's how you get rid of feedback like that. You just frequency shift the puppy up about 10 hertz. So you do that like this. Uh, let's throw a Hilbert transform at it. Then we do complex mod. And we have to modulate both sides of the Hilbert transform. And then I need uh, a number of hertz to shift by. And now, first off, let's just test it and make sure it's doing frequency shifting for me. Uh, I'll just do that one. Okay, are we getting frequency shifting? And I'll shift either up or down. I don't know which way it's going to go. Hello? Okay, good. So now I'm going to just say, let's just shift down 10 hertz so that it's actually, you know, if you're not listening carefully, it sounds like it's coming out at the correct pitch, especially because I'm not singing, and I'm not going to sing to disprove that. <laughs> and now we turn that off and turn on the reverberator. And now we've got, well... Forgot to connect it. Connect, connect. And now we've got a nice reverberator that we can push a lot harder. I'm pushing at least six more dB. And I'm, you know, not exactly comfortable with this, but it's not succeeding in blowing up. In fact, at some risk to our sanity, I'll see if I actually really can push it a bit further. And now you get a wonderful effect. This is a huge gain, right? Because you can, I mean, I'm, I'm a full meter away from the microphone off its axis, and you're getting great amplification <laughs> and stable feedback. It cannot find a frequency to feed back at because whatever frequency it decides to howl at, it comes out at 10 hertz higher, and so it loses. <laughs> so it's like those problems dogs get when their tails itch or something. <laughs> All right, so, um, so don't tell anyone I told you to do this. This is an old sound engineering trick that they do in, in uh, sports arenas and stuff like that. Um, and as long as you don't really care about audio quality, this is cool. Oh, but in fact, I should say something else about that, which is this. Um, this reverberator is, is your way, or is the easiest way to um, pitchify a voice. All right, so if you want to make someone sing, send this up to about 90%, say. By the way, that that uh, doubled the 
that doubled the peak amplitude, that doubled the peak gain, so that added 60 dB to the output. So we're now really at the edge. And now it should be the case. Let's give let's give myself a nice um, major, uh, sorry, perfect fifth, so that you can enjoy a proper interval here. And now everything that I put out, hello, are we work? Oh right, I've, I turned this off now. Yeah, oh right, because the output is running. And now I've got me with um, with a nice. Oh, it doesn't sound terribly coherent yet, but anyway. Anything that I do is now got a pitch. To get that kind of pitch, you have to send this thing to a, heat, a very close to one. At this point, it, you know, it, uh, each each new cycle is ninety percent of the previous one, so it dies out. At, uh, you know, it, it cuts out after ten. Well, that's the right word. Drops by a factor of one over e in ten cycles. That's technically, what happens. So it's that's enough of a ringing to give you a sense of pitch. But it also gave us a gain of 10, like 20 dB at, at the resonant frequencies. But I'm getting away with it because I'm preventing it from feeding back by frequency shifting it. And if I took that frequency shifter out right now, it would not work at all. It would just be buried in feedback. And now I'm going to turn this down <laughs> before we do anything else. <laughs> right. Um, and of course, there's a, a if you can play games. Uh, this is actually a lot of fun. If you um, if you turn the amount of frequency shift down to something like three or four hertz, then you get very interesting, not quite stable, not quite unstable feedback situations. Um, yeah, why not? Since we're here, uh, I'll give this two hertz, and now I'll ease it up rather carefully because to do this we have to. Hello, are we here? Yeah. Now what I really need. What I really need to do is to clip it severely on the input so that I don't get, so that when it does feed back, it doesn't feed back badly. So let's clip it to minus 0 0.1 and 0 0.1. All right, that's very, very, oh, sorry, one hundredth, like that. All right, so now what's going to happen is whatever comes in is going to be, um, is going to be reduced in volume extremely. And what we're going to be doing is just using that clipping permanently. And now I'll push it to instability. And if I do this right, if I've done this right, it can't get terribly loud because that clip is preventing it from getting more than minus 40 dB. So theoretically we're safe even though it's unstable. So now what we have is an unstable feedback network that is only being controlled by the fact that it's nonlinear. And the other thing is, if you don't do anything, it'll just do this. But if you do something, well, actually, it's not. It's ignoring me now. But if I do something that exceeds the sound pressure in the room, then I control it. Like maybe, mm, right? But then when I stop, it finds its own preferred frequency to mess with. That's two hertz. That's this frequency shift, because what's happening is it's, I don't know how to explain that. It's not exactly two hertz, I don't think, but. And I should be able to slow it down now. The next thing you might want to do, if you wanted to make this a little more musical, is you would now low pass filter it so that it was doing all that good stuff up to say a kilohertz and then after that dropping off because after a while that's going to be a little bit too much highs. But I'll show you much more about that later. Now right now I just want to start doing just sort of stick to stick to theory which is where I really should be right now. Okay so that's um so that's just sort of a trick about um uh, about making unstable feedback networks. Now the problem is, what should I leave you with here? <laughs> should I leave that thing in the circuit? Uh, well, I'm going to come back and do this later in a, in a more systematic way. So right now what I think I should do is get rid of it. Anyway, you'll see it. If you, if you go grab the movie, there will be screen dumps galore with this thing on it. Okay, so now we're going to go back to uh, 
Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not going to hook the ADC up to it yet because I might be testing this with pulses first to, to just sort of try things out. So now, um, what we got now is uh, a thing which I'll test it this way. Okay, so so it's a it's two delay networks that are now tuned a fifth apart from each other. So what could we do? Oh, yuck. So what what could we do to make the thing not sound like it's pitchy? Well, one thing that we could do is we could just drop the you know, uh, just drop the pitches to where you can't hear them as pitches at all. More than that. Something like that. And now we've got another problem. This is a lousy reverberator for another reason, which is that you hear flutter, or what's called flutter, which is in fact just the fact that you hear the, the individual delays. You, you just hear the echoes, right? So... All right, so another thing to try, let's go back to, I'll go back to small delays now. Let's just tell them each to go into the other one. I guess I do this. Is this yeah, I guess this will work. Yeah, keep worrying it and make this unstable. Well... <laughs> That didn't do much for us because, in fact, what that really did was that make, made one long delay of 25 milliseconds, and it simply, <laughs> and it simply spelled it in, in two smaller delays. Actually, it did a little bit better than that because it gives us a tap in the middle of it, but it still, you know, it still has the same density problems. That's to say, you still hear the, the uh, no more delays than you did. Sorry, no more time density than you did, and you still hear a very strong kind of pitchiness. Well, all right, so let's try something else. Um, theory, let's try theory. So the next thing to, to think about is this. Um, are there other ways of combining these two signals that maintain the total power of the signals so that when this thing works in a feedback loop, it will be power preserving? And the answer is yes, of course. We know how to do power preserving mixtures of two signals. What you do is you apply a rotation matrix to it. So now, theory time. I have to go show you rotation matrices a little bit. Um, let's see. So to do that, I'm going to go here. And I need to do a save as, I think. Uh, I have no idea how to get this. Uh, all right, I don't know. Okay, now I'm going to just get rid of everything and start talking about rotation matrices. So the, so the rotation matrix thing is this. Um, if you have... All right, first off, if you have a signal, what's the instantaneous power of the signal? It's the square of, of the value of the signal. That's if it's real value, which is what we're doing at the moment. And if you have two signals, then what the, power of the, of what the total combined power of the two signals is is the sum of the squares of the two. And the cool thing about that is you can... You can then interpret that in this kind of way. If, if horizontal axis is one of the signals and if vertical axis is the other signal, then whatever the point is, well, whatever the two signals have as an instantaneous value is a point somewhere in that plane. This is the point which is some pair of signals x and y, if you like. Eh, that's bad. That's a point. <laughs> and this here is the square root of x squared plus y squared. So the power of the th of the, the the power of the combined power of the signals x and y is the square of the distance of that point from the origin. Now, why am I? Uh, next question is sometimes why. Well, <laughs> or what is this? You know, what is it? Uh, it doesn't mean anything to take two signals and call them a point on the plane? And the answer is, of course, it doesn't mean anything. This is math. It doesn't mean anything. You just, it's just what you do to think about this. Um, and so f this is the same plot that I was showing when I was plotting the input of the filter versus the output of the filter, because the input was the horizontal axis and the output was the vertical axis. So if, for instance, I put a sinusoid in the horizontal axis and, a, and a, if I put Sorry, if I put cosine omega t in the in the horizontal axis and sine omega t in the vertical axis, then the the combined result would trace a circle. 
I can't draw it. Well, I'll draw it and then erase it. We'd, we'd trace a unit circle that would just repeatedly race around the, uh, the origin. And the radius of that circle would be the power of the sum of those two signals. And that's an interesting thing. That means that if you had a two signals that were 90 degrees out of phase, the sum of the powers of those two signals would be constant at every instant in time. When the sine was up or, or down, when the sine had power in it, either positive or negative, then the cosine is zero and vice versa. They, they just swap off the power. Uh, yeah, better not to elaborate that anymore. So now I'm going to get rid of the circle. Oh, well, okay. So, so a circle, you know, a sine and a cosine in quadrature is a is a signal which ha happens to have constant uh, constant power. In general, a signal doesn't look like that. It looks like mm, something which is just wiggling around some way or other, and not even necessarily always going in the direction of a cosine, it's just doing whatever it's doing. But, it is, it, but it's still the case that at any moment in time, this distance, or the square of that distance, is the power of that signal at that moment. Now, the reason that I'm describing that is because, now, take that signal and imagine rotating it around the origin at any angle you want. So let's say, well, 90 degrees is a little bit special, but it would be easier to draw it if I made it something like 90 degrees. So. I don't know. I'm just going to try to make a make one that was a little further around. Oh, I can't do it. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, pretend that was the other thing rotated by 30-ish degrees, which is not. Um, <laughs> then it would be the case that at any moment in time, the power of the rotated signal would be equal to the power of the of the signal before being rotated. Now, why does the pow why does the combined power of the two signals mean anything at all? Well, it would. If, if those were two wires, it really would be the instantaneous power that was going down the two wires if you added them up together. So it actually would have a physical meaning. And in fact, if you give things physical meanings like that, even if you're not in a physical system at all, then frequently that can give you ways of reasoning about what the system does that uh, are both intuitive and mathematically controllable, dealable with, tractable. Right. So um, now, the next question, how do you rotate a point by an angle around the origin? And the answer is this. And once more in, well, so let's do this. So here's a point, and the point is x comma y. In other words, the horizontal axis is, you know, horizontally it's x and vertically it's y. And now I want to uh, rotate it by some angle theta to a new point. What's the new point? The new point is this, x cosine theta, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, minus y sine theta, comma, y cosine theta plus x sine theta. Those are two numbers, two, two expressions, so that's a point, and those are the coordinates of the point which is the other point rotated by theta. Now, why am I bothering to do this? Because this is a power-preserving transformation, and we don't have many of those. All we have so far is switching the two signals, which is stupid. <laughs> this is a non-trivial thing that actually preserves power. And it's even better than that. It's linear. It's linear in the sense that uh, x, the, the input x gets multiplied by these coefficients, cosine theta and sine theta, to appear at the output. So there's no harmonic distortion or anything like that. There could be, what's the right word? Uh, these, two, these two signals might cancel each other, but in that case, these two signals couldn't possibly cancel each other because power is preserved, so that meant all the power would have gone over to this of the, this of the two signals. So it can move power from, the, from one of the wires to the other and back, depending on the frequency, but it won't, um, but it won't change the overall power and it won't do anything nonlinear. So it won't, for instance, introduce frequencies that weren't there before. And it's also, uh, there's no time delay in this. This is all instantaneous. It's just a bunch of gains. So it's really just two mixtures of the signal. Right? Well, this is such a powerful thing that people just use this all the time. And the way you would use it, let's see, let's see that. The way you would use it, I have a feeling of impending disaster here, but let's just keep going. 
Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get I'm going to get this um, amplitude way down. Let's do it wrong first and show you what happens when you make a nice recirculating delay network wrong. So I'm going to turn the volume down first. Okay, so I'm going to now. Um, so I'm going to have a number theta. Um, let's just make it an inlet, actually. And what I'm going to oops, sorry. Let's put that. Oh, it's Sorry, I already have the inlet, which is the, the signal that we're adding. That's yeah, all right. I have, all right. Oh, let's put this one over here. And that's ugly. Well, all right, let's just let it be ugly. Okay, so this thing now we're going to take the sine and cosine of. And I'm going to do it, um, the, tempted to do it the computer music way, but I'm going to do it the correct way. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, Sine, does this exist? Yeah, and then cosine. Oh, let's, um, before we do that, let's, uh, let's give ourselves a number box to see it. And let's make it a nice big fat one because we're going to have fractions here. And sine and cosine work in radians, so this is going to be kind of ugly. Oh, cosine, please. And the other thing is, of course, the Greeks named them wrong. Cosine should have come first like that, because cosine, you know, cosine is the x-axis and sine is the y-axis, so really cosine should have been named sine and vice versa, but we, but we live with the nomenclature that we have in, inherited. All right, and now what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the first one by the cosine and the second one by the sine and add them. So that's a multiplier. Hey, come here. Shift. And a multi... Now, why did that happen? Okay. Multiply tilde. Got it. Okay, so we're going to multiply this by cosine and this by sine. And add them. I'm going to add them explicitly because that's good style. And now I'm going to see if that actually agrees with the thing that I drew here. And notice I have a minus here and I'm deliberately doing it wrong and putting a plus. I'll, I'll fix it and make it a minus later. Now I'm going to make this one, which is taking the same, same basic idea. We take the first one and multiply it by the sine. Take the second one and multiply it by the cosine. Let's move this in a little closer so you can see that all happening. Let's move these down a little bit. Oops. There. That's not so bad. And now this is a little ugly. Let's fix this like this. All right. Now, if I've done this wrong, this will be unstable. Let's see. So I now have an input here. There's the signal input. Yeah. And th this input now is for controlling the angle, which is unfortunately in radians from 0 to 2 pi, because that's the way sine and cosine uh, interpret their inputs. Um, and now, let's see, we have small block size, and we've got the, oh, we've got everything set up here already. So let's see if we're getting stuff. Oh, before we do that, let's put 0 in here. Zero is fine. If, you, if you're rotating by zero degrees, there's no change, and so we're not doing anything. Okay. And just checking with this thing, the cosine of nothing is one, and the sine of nothing is zero. So if I put zero in, it gets its x, and this is y. So mirabili dictu, if we rotate by zero, we get back to the point x, y. Good check. Okay. Now we start rotating, and of course I deliberately did it wrong so that when we start rotating it'll blow up. And that is what happens when you don't design your reverb networks right. It just finds a good frequency it can feed back at and goes there and ignores your input. Right? And right now the only thing that's keeping it from blowing up is the fact that I'm clipping it. And 
Yep. And now I go back to no rotation and we were back where we were. Okay, so now let's fix it. So the fix is that this really should have been a minus instead of a plus. So that means now this is the this is x, the signal x times cosine of theta minus y times sine of theta, which is what the expression really said. And now, of course, I might have made some non-deliberate mistakes. Now let's be careful, though. There it is. Most of what you could tell me about this is it's inharmonic. So there's no rotation at all. A quarter circle is pi over 2. No, sorry. Yes, yeah, pi over 2, which is 1.57, I think. And then maybe 45 degrees is a half of that, which is about here. And now we've got thing. Now this is. Not a great reverberator yet, but it does have the property that you can't really hear the, or at least it, at least I can find here some angle at which you no longer can really talk about the thing having a pitch. Okay. And now checking it out just as a reverberator. Let's see, that's 1.04. Oh, nice. But of course, I took my nice Hilbert transform out because it was bad practice, and now I want it back. <laughs> well, actually, rather than do that, let's just let's just tempt fate by pushing this, these gains up. All right. No great shakes yet, but. But at any rate, now we have found ourselves with a family of delay networks, all of which have different characteristics. Now you could sort of hope that you could now combine that with a bunch of other delays in, in some way or other and get ourselves into a believable, responsible reverberator. By the way, these noise bursts that I'm feeding this reverberator are the worst test that you, well, are one of the worst tests that you can possibly give a reverberator. So if we can get this thing to sound good for these noise bursts, we're going to be very happy about our reverb design. Um, okay, so where do you go from here? Well, one place that you can go from here is um, to say this is all fine and good, but okay, I need to save this patch before I go simplifying it. This is fine and good, but this is actually more than we need because it actually turns out to be pretty okay just to use 45 degree rotations. And 45 degrees is a special rotation because when you do 45 degrees, the um, cosine and the sine of 45 degrees are equal because it's only an eighth of a way around the circle. So the, the triangle becomes isosceles, if you like. Um, and what that's telling you is this. Take the two signals and subtract them and stick them in one reverb and add them and stick them in, the, sorry, into one output and add them and stick them into the other output and then normalize by this one constant, which is turns out to be one over the square root of two. And then you've got yourself a simple way of combining two signals that's power preserving. So it literally is, if you want to take two signals and, and mix them but power preservingly, add them and subtract them, and then renormalize by 0 0.7071, which is the square root of 2 over 2, or 1 over the square root of 2. And then you've got an equal power version of the signals that's mixed. All right. Now, how do you, how do you now use this to design a production reverberator. What you would do is this, and I'm not going to take you all the way through the production reverberator design because it's too much, but, but I'll get you a little bit of, of ways in. So let's, um, oh, so I'm going to save this. Sorry, the, we have to branch here at some point. There are two branches to go along. One is production reverb design, and the other is going back and making this into a resonant filter, which is another thing that we can do with the same technique. So the, so the first branch is going to be a little more about re reverb design and then, then back to resonant filter. So I'm going to do a save as again. 
and now it's going to be six dot reverberator. Okay, so the reverberator, I'm going to leave it with a small block size, but at this, at this point we don't care about the small block size because we're not going to be using, uh, we're not going to be using stupid small delays. In fact, let's, um, and for that reason actually I guess I'm not going to say small, but I'm going to say delays. And I'm going to get rid of the, oh wait, no. Then I'm going to get rid of the block so that it can actually go, con so with, with the block tilde 1, it was doing everything with the block size of 1, which was multiplying the, the computation time by 30 or some, 20 or 30, somewhere in there. So I'm going to take that out so that we can be fast. And the only thing that we're going to miss is not, not being able to make these delays be less than 1.45 milliseconds, but we're not going to want to do that for this purpose anyway, so we're happy. So first, uh, first thing about that is this. Uh, okay, we're going to multiply, oh, yeah. First thing is, let's blow this off altogether and just add and subtract. Just like this. Minus and plus. Um, okay, now of course this is bad. Ooh, in fact, it's probably blown up now. Well, it's okay, we got these clips. Um, this is bad because I didn't multiply by the 0 0.707, so actually this has a gain of... of it has a gain. It's gonna. It's it's got a three dB gain in it in there. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to remember that I'm going to have to divide by something in the end to make everything even out. But the thing is, I'm already I've already got this multiplier here set up, and I'm also going to simplify this like this. Oops. And now I'm going to take this number and multiply it by. 0 0.7071. That's the square root of 2 over 2, or it's 1 over the square root of 2. And that, I'll just normalize, I'll just put that normalizing factor right in the multiplier. Like that. All right. And now, uh, oh, actually, let's just check this and see if it's doing the right thing still. So we... Metronome's still going. Something's bad. Oh, I think I needed to do this. Yeah. And now I don't hear anything. Oh, there it is. All right, so that's this nasty reverberator we still got. Okay. Um, when you're making a reverberator, uh, just like in Carpus Strong, what you do really is you put a low-pass filter in. Maybe like this, actually, it's going to be a little bit more interesting than that. What you're really going to want to do is have a low pass and mix it with the original signal. But I'm going to be a little oversimplified. I'm going to oversimplify slightly and just put a straight low pass filter in. Okay, and now we've got. Yeah. Still hear the pitches in a way that I wouldn't have expected, but that's all right. Now what we do, of course, you probably knew this was coming, is we add more delay lines like this. Now, like how to, am I all right? Oh, one thing is, you really shouldn't have chosen 10 and 15 as delay times because common divisor, bad, bad. So I'll, I'll fix that later. Now we're going to have delays called TED3 and TED4. No relation to NRA. Do what? What did I do? Oh, thank you. Yeah, good. No relation to TED Nugent. Okay, and now what else do I need? I got the low passes in there. Oh, I got I could or could not inject the. At this point, I'm not sure if it's appropriate to inject the signal in all the delays. That's the thing that is going to be a question of reverb design. And now I have to add the next trick. The next trick is this: I've got a mixing in pairs, but why not mix the pairs in pairs? C 
So now what we want to do is mix this one and this one, and mix number one and three, and then mix number two and four. And then if we do that, then we've got everything mixed in with everything. So let me just do it first. So it's going to be a minus, by the way, um, yeah. minus and plus. I could have said plus and minus, and it turns out that when you're tuning a reverberator, it's going to make a difference which of these two you use where, and I forget exactly how it's going to work. I'm going to just do it this way for now. Let's see how it goes. Plus and minus. All right, so I'm going to do the same thing, except I'm going to do it to numbers 1 and 3. So I'm going to add, uh, subtract them like this. And I'm going to add them like this. Similarly, 2 and 4, I'm going to add them like this. It doesn't matter whether I add and subtract or subtract and add, at least for the purposes of power preserving this. And now I send them all into their feedback paths. Well, let's be less sloppy about it. And now I th I'm not sure everybody's got the new... Whoa, baby. Oh, right. And now I need this. This now needs to be... We need two times this factor. And uh, the square root of two, if you square it, you get two. Or to put it another way, if you square a half twice, square root of a half, you square it, you get a half. So a half uh, c corrects both for these and also for these. And now we can go all the way up to close to 100. Oh, right. And now we have to mess with the delay times because they're badly chosen. And now we've got sort of a spring reverb quality reverb. <laughs> yeah, are we using anything? Yeah, right. And here I'm using relatively prime numbers because then there's less chance of getting weird syzygies. In fact, I should really throw little bits of English in there. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. So let me shut this thing up for a second. Um, okay, so 1 and 4, so there is a path from 1 to 4. 1 goes into 2, which then goes into 4. So in fact, there's a path from everything into everything. Well, it'll sound different. <laughs> and nobody knows what order you should do it in, so you have to try them all. And some of them sound better than others. None of them sounds great, but some of them sound really bad, and some of them sound acceptable. Uh, what people really do is they do this, but they usually go up to 8 or 16 delays instead of just 4. And they also uh, do, s do things to increase the density of the sound beyond what I'm doing here, which is that you can, you can basically... There are different ways of thinking about it, but you can, you can, for instance, tap the delay lines, have several taps that then you add together to increase the density of delays. Or you can take the signal itself and do... Um, um, and do another sort of preliminary delay network to it to give it a lot of very short delays. And there, are, you know, you could you could do this until the cows come home. A, a proper design is the one in Rev One, which is a stock PD object, which looks oh god no let's not use a Rev, uh, no, no, no 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 not Rev One Rev One is weird Rev Three here we go. Rev three oh early delays is uh, now if you look at this you'll see the same uh, the same operation going on which is power preserving mixture but here there's a trick which is take any signal you want and delay it this is actually just a delay line separated in two PDs and then mix and then delay one of the two and then mix again delay one of the two and mix and each time you do one of these delays you double the number of echoes that you've got because you take all the echoes and you do that to them and then you then the mix thing makes both signals have all the delays, and then you delay one of them again, and then the number of delays doubles again. So this is a way of generating either 16 or 32 delayed copies of the signal, I think. I forget. I think 16, but I'm not sure. And that turns out to be enough to get the density up quite decently, because here's the recirculating thing. <laughs> and this is the sort of thing that happens when you use PD for too long. So here, here's 16 delay reads with... Um, 
sort of yeah, maybe linearly increasing delay times. That seems to work better than making all the delay times roughly the same because you want a couple to be really short, but you don't want more than just a couple to be really short. And this is exactly the same thing. Here's, here's the gain that's getting multiplied by all of them. <laughs> and then here's mixing them by twos and then mixing them by twos and then by mixing them by twos and then mixing them by twos one more time to get six. This is, this is the same thing, by the way, as a butterfly network that one uses in a Radix 2 FFT, except it's slightly, I mean, it's, it's the same geometry that the exact operations are different. Yeah, so there's a proper reverberator. That's red three. Questions about all this? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I should have, yeah, I should have explained that better. The, actually, the, okay, so in the yoga of reverb design, what people say is this. Uh, the air absorbs high frequencies slightly more than it absorbs low frequencies. And so to emulate a path in the air, you filter slightly as well as delay. And you chose 5,000 sort of arbitrary? That was thoroughly arbitrary, and in fact it's it's th thoroughly wrong to boot because what this is saying is that in what this is saying is that in um, say 15 milliseconds, which might be the mean of these paths, the thing actually loses 3 dB of energy at 5 kilohertz, which is completely unphysical. Really, this should be a much higher number, but I don't actually know what it should be. But what you really would do is you would take a low pass, you would use the low pass to describe a rollover frequency, but then you would mix in the original signal, you would make you'd make a weighted average of the low pass and the original signal to control both the roll off and the amount it rolls off down to, which shouldn't be less than you know, 0.7 or something like that. So you would take 0.7 times the original signal plus 0.3 times something like that. And is the high pass true in DC now or relevant? Where is um, Good question. Uh, I believe it is. I don't believe you need it now. But I bet you will find that reverb designers, just as a matter of superstition, throw it in anyway. <laughs> because everyone who does design a reverb has had their reverb blow up in that way for one reason or another. Okay, so this is kind of this is enough of reverb design for now, because now what we do is we go back to making the delays be really short and showing you how to then go back and design resonant filters. So that's kind of the next thing. Um, so just to back up, what's going on here, or just to summarize, what's going on here is, is there's something coming out of these delays, and except for this attenuation, the, this whole network is power preserving so that you can then take that transform thing and stick them back into the, into the delays and do it in a way that will feed back stably. That's, that's what's going on. And so power preserving operations and feedback are friends because you want, to, you want to worry about power preservation as you're feeding back. Even if you don't want to preserve power, you want to not preserve power on purpose, not because your network had some stupid um, incorrectness to it. Okay. More questions about this, or should I move on to the resonant filter? So to get to the resonant filter, what I do is close this patch all together. So uh, let's, you don't really need to see Rev3. Oh, Rev3, by the way, is in, in the PD release. Okay, so I'm gonna save that, and then I'm gonna open number five. But I'm going to save it as number seven. And this is going to be a resonant, I guess. Well, we'll see. I don't know if we'll get that far tonight. But we can at least go in that right direction. Okay. So did, did I? Yes, I do have the matrix. and the Yeah, right. And I kept the cosine and sine thing. Okay. So the next thing to, to think about is this. Going back to this picture. <laughs> this picture. <laughs> um, if you had two points, well, if, if you had a audio signal coming out of a delay line and, well, 
two delay lines, so you had two audio signals, X and Y, and you rotated them by theta, stuck them back in, and then one sample later, the, ne the very next sample took them back out and rotated them by another theta and so on, you'd have yourself an oscillator because the thing would simply rotate by theta every single sample. And if you just looked at, say, the output of X, you would see a sinusoid. And if you looked at them both, both together, you would see two sinusoids that were in quadrature. So whether or not you believe that, um, we're all set up to do it because here we have delay line. It's blocked one. I've told the delay. Oh, in fact, I'll even tell it now. Zero. Not just. I won't just leave it blank, but I'll actually tell it zero just to emphasize that we are doing the minimum possible delay, which is one sample. And I'm going to leave it in radians now, but pretty soon I'm going to wish it was in better units so that's that's coming. But right now, right now what we're doing is um, we're taking whatever comes in. Uh, we don't need this anymore, do we? <laughs> I'll probably pay for this, but let's not have that. All right. So now all that happens is the thing gets attenuated. Oh, in fact, do I need? Yeah, I probably should keep the attenuation. And in fact, that probably should also be a an inlet. So I should do something like this. And for sanity's sake, I'm still going to clip. But if I put reasonable numbers in here, the clipping won't occur. Like if I keep the amplitudes around one, it'll, it'll never actually clip. So this is so you can pretend the clips aren't there. So all that's happening is the inlet is getting added. Let's just add it to one of them. In fact, that's even slightly simpler. So all that's happening is the inlet, which will be an impulse, goes into one of them, which we can regard as X. And then we just keep rotating the thing around by whatever this thing is. And then we just enjoy the output, which is going to be an oscillator. All right. So is that really true? We will see. Uh, first off, let's see. What can I do here? I can say full blast. And here I'm going to give it an angle. Uh, I don't know, 0 point. I'm going to give it a 20th of a radian. Just guessing. I don't know if that's a good value or not. Actually, I'm going to do it out here so you can see it. And is anything happening? Now, um, I actually feel like putting a real impulse in here. Let's see if I have it. Ah, of course, spell it. Ah. Pulse. Of course, I don't actually remember if I made a copy of this here or not. And I don't remember if the name had a tilde in it or not. No, I don't have an impulse generator. Okay. Do I want to make an? You guys want to know how to make an impulse generator? Of course you don't. Uh, what's the easiest way to get an impulse in PD? The easiest way to get an impulse in PD. If you really, yeah. Oh, the easiest way to make an impulse in PD is probably to reuse the thing that I was showing you how to do. So let's say PD impulse. This is this is not going to make you feel good. We're going to say block one, and then we're going to say del read. Uh, I don't know what. And now, zero delayed read. Now I'm going to write to it. Oh, this is going to be ugly. Now we're going to put in an input and inlet, which is just going to get a bang. Ugh. Come here. No, just an inlet. And then it's going to tell a signal to turn to change to one and then with a delay go back to zero. So how about one? Uh, and then I'm going to say delay one millisecond. <laughs> That's pretty stupid. Yeah, yeah I'm going to make it worse. Just make sure it's at least a block and then I'm going to turn it back off. All right, so that'll make myself a nice little rectangle pulse. And here, actually, it's probably worth going ahead and saying, yeah, I want a signal whose value is this. Now, to get the impulse, you take this and then you delay it one sample, and you invert it, and then you multiply them. 
so that the thing has to be on, but it hasn't been on for more than a sample. Yuck, I hate this. All right, so we're going to write into the delay. We're going to read the delay. We're going to force the read to actually be one sample by... <laughs> Do I really want to do this? What's the best way to do this? The best way to do this might be to actually tell it how many, how much to delay it. So I'll say, make a second, it's worth, but give me 0 0.02. That'll be a sample because that's one fifty thousandth of a sample, which will round out to one sample at any reasonable sample rate. But really what I should do is measure the sample rate, but let's not. And then I'm going to say signal 1 and subtract that. And then I'm going to multiply these two. This will never work. This is too complicated to work the first time. When I do it, I don't do it this way. I actually use an object that is a FIR filter <laughs> that makes it a little bit easier than this, but I'm doing this in order to not introduce a bunch of stuff. Now, does it work? So to find that out, we say bang, and then I'm just going to say print tilde, and print it right when the bang happens. And nothing. Oh. Ta-da, impulse. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, you know what I should have done? I should have just made a table and put one in the first element and played it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you always think of <laughs> Okay, now we're going to take our impulse, and we're going to, that was, we paid for in blood, and um, we're going to throw it in our nice reverberator, and there it is. Wow, why is that already playing? I don't know why that is playing. It's not playing, ooh, 120, that's bad. Limit this to 100. All right. Clear it out. Let's tell it to be 100. And now I believe if I put an impulse in, that will come. A unit amplitude sinusoid, which has 97 dB, which is the correct volume. All right. Now, why is this interesting? This is interesting because... This is a linear network, so it functions as a filter. Now what I've got is a filter that takes an impulse and turns it into a sinusoid that lasts forever. So this is a filter whose impulse response lasts forever and is a sinusoid. Or if I look at the two outputs, I'll see a sinusoid and a cosine and quadrature. Now if I didn't want it to last forever, all I would have to do is go in here and say, well, you who was 100, why don't you just be 99? Or actually, 99.9, some number close to 1. And then if I feed it my impulse, I get not carpless strong, but sinusoid that dies out. And by the way, this is the cosine output that's making that click. If I just listen to the sine output, it'll, it won't be discontinuous. Now, for instance, I could take my ADC and run that in there, and there that would be a filter. Or actually, better yet, uh, that was an impulse, but now let's throw some noise at it. Let's take this way down before we do this. And now, as I change the angle, and I've got resonant filter sound. Okay, questions about this. Oh, thank you. The angle corresponds to pitch in the following way. If you took the angle and, let's see, the angle is the pitch in radians per sample. Or to put it another way, if you multiplied it by the sample rate divided by 2 pi, you'd see the pitch in hertz. Or to put it another way, if you put pi in there, you would get the Nyquist. Yeah, I should.
should have done that. That looks like this. Um, I'm just going to cheat and say and assume that we are 44, 100. And then pi, 2 pi is 6.283 ish. This now should display this number in hertz. accurate is it? It's as accurate as you care. It's going to be like six digit accurate. Actually, I would need to put another digit on here to get six digit accuracy because I've forgotten the value of two pi. But uh, but this will be this will be right in tune. For instance, if I now say oscillator, of course you have to believe that the oscillator is, is good. But if I now oscillate at this frequency and listen to that, I believe the result will be the same to within like a tenth or a hundredth of a hertz. Oh, wait. Um, well, doesn't make it. Oh, right, because I didn't do this. And anyway, uh, the other thing I didn't do was. Oh, it's wrong. Oh, yeah, it's all right. And if I change this to be the oscillator again, then you would then you would hear exactly the same pitch. That is much enough for one day. So I will leave you with this. Um, the the next thing to do is to go in here and start making this thing be nonlinear. And then you get 